Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ceylon College of Physicians Specialty Update. Uh, this month, the uh, collaborating college is the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, and I have with me um, Geeta, Dr. Geeta Pereira, who is the president of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, the, the specialty update is in pulmonology. So I will hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Geetal Pereira, who will introduce the speakers and proceed with the session. Thank you, Prof. Seneca. Uh, our first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Amita Fernando. He is the consultant respiratory physician at National Hospital of Sri Lanka and the Central Chest Clinic, Colombo. He will be speaking to you about the challenges for the clinician management of severe COVID pneumonia in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dr. Fernando. Thank you, Seneca and Gisa. Uh, thank you, for CCP, uh, for inviting me to speak on this occasion on a very important topic. Uh, okay. So, a little over one and a half years now, we have been dealing with uh, patients with COVID. Uh, severe COVID pneumonia, uh, moderate, uh, moderate to severe COVID pneumonia is the area that I'm going to uh, concentrate on. Uh, my talk is mo mostly based on experience, and some of this may not be evidence-based. At subsequent talks, you'll hear the existing evidence uh, on management strategies. Uh, as, as said, uh, when it comes to COVID, it's more guidance than guidelines because the evidence is sparse and still emerging. So uh, the outline of my talk is I'll give an overview of the challenges that we have faced, uh, a little bit of understanding of the pathophysiology, and I'll try to... Uh, bring in some illustrative cases. Uh, so the challenges that we face in the initial phase, the viremic phase, uh, the, it, it gives, uh, COVID gives rise to a severe viral pneumonitis. As you know, the, the, the spike protein, ACE receptor, I'm not going to go into such detail. Uh, this viral pneumonitis can result in diffuse alveolar damage or dead as we call it. Uh, this is associated with severe hypoxemia. Uh, in as much as 30 to 40 percent of patients, this may give rise, uh, they may also arise a hyperimmune system or the hyperimmune response or the so-called cytokine storm. A significant proportion of patients, almost one third, have thromboembolic com complications. This may vary from microthrombi, uh, causing end organ damage, resulting in myocardial infarctions, acute kidney injury and stroke, to frank pulmonary embolism. There, there's also a pulmonary vasculopathy, which may give, uh, which may give rise to changes in uh, circulatory changes in the pulmonary, arter pulmonary arterial system uh, giving rise to uh, due, due to a hypox due to the hypoxemic response secondary sepsis always a challenge uh, may result uh, from viral mediated immune suppression and the immune modulatory medication that we used in treatment most of the secondary bacterial pathogens at least in literature are coliforms but we see the usual icu pathogens of acinito pseudomonas playing, playing a role uh, the mrsa how Frequent MRSA or methicillin resistant staphylococci are isolated. Um, I don't think there's very much evidence for this. Uh, the co there have also been concerns that proning may cause gut organisms, like especially the coliforms, uh, to be an important cause of secondary bacterial sepsis. Fungal pathogens, aspergillus, we are familiar with this during the influenza pandemic, and also the new emerging evidence of muco or the black fungus from India. Uh, and subsequent to all this, there's an aberrant repair process also. This ab aberrant repair process may be a, hype, may be a hyper acute process, uh, giving rise to acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia and the classical forms of organizing pneumonia that we chest physicians are familiar with. In the late stages of a disease, this may progress into a fa fi frankly fibrotic uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, there's also the challenge of managing existing complications like uh, obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lung diseases, interstitial lung disease, COPD, lung malignancies. Uh, CKD, post-KT, organ transplant recipient, malignancy, other malignancies, and patients who are on immunosuppressive medications. Uh, the prolonged lockdowns leading to uh, dysfunction and disorganization of clinics and patients being medication being delivered at home and, uh, and uh, the monitoring system not being a proper monitoring system, a community-based monitoring system not being in place has resulted in many complicated medical problems, which we see when we, were when we are currently managing wards 14 and 56A at NHSL, the HDO high dependency units. Uh, so late presentation is another concern. Uh, and severe hypoxemia, a high ventilator demand in these patients, giving rise to intrathoracic pressure swings, 
leading to a self-inflicted lung injury, patient self-inflicted lung injury, or uh, uh, silly, uh, and modalities of treatment like CPAP, NIV, uh, mechanical ventilation, and even in some instances, high flow nasal oxygen may contribute to uh, ventilator-induced uh, lung injuries or will. Uh, these have resulted in pneumomediastinum, pneumopericardium, subcutaneous emphysema, and pneumothoraces. Uh, and also, uh, we see the, the existence of different phenotypes. We see the, the, this L phenotype and the H phenotype. L phenotype with low elastance, high compliance, uh, mostly a reticular kind of change. The H phenotype with uh, low, uh, low el elastance but high, low compliance but high elastance. Uh, the classical ARDS-like picture where you see diffuse uh, ground glass changes and a basal predominant uh, consolidations and also a fibrotic type uh, due to this aberrant processes of repair. So uh, as we said, uh, we need to understand the, very, the phases of the disease also and the timing and the chronology of it. Sometimes it's difficult to get the exact timing. It is not the PCR positivity, but the onset of symptoms. So there's a viremic phase, there's a pulmonary phase, there's a hypoxemic phase, there's a hyperimmune phase, there's a recovery phase, and uh, one may merge into the other. Uh, so all of these phases have their own biochemical profiles inflammatory markers and also uh, radiological profiles. The, the, the subplural ground glass consolidations with crazy paving, later on, uh, later on developing to more, more denser consolidations and the classical forms of uh, organizing pneumonia or fibrosis later on. So the chronology is also important to remember when dealing this way with these patients. So uh, dexamethasone and enoxaparin have been the standard of care. Uh, six milligrams daily after the recovery trial and uh, inoxiparin, but there is some confusion regarding the doses. Uh, six milligram daily, is this enough? Should we go for a higher steroid dose? What should be that higher dose? Is it 10 BD IV for five days or six milligrams IV BD, BD for five days? And the argument being that uh, for if you are giving steroid fights and anti, anti inflammatory properties, uh, you should have at least 100 milligrams equivalent of prednisolone. So uh, there's the argument saying that is it is uh, six milligrams of IV dexamethasone, which will amount about 40 prednisolone. Is it enough? Uh, should we uh, go for a higher dose? So I think in the later talks, when Amila talks about the emerging evidence, he will discuss this in more detail, but I'm giving the practical uh, parts of it. So in methyl prednisone, whom, when, what doses? So there's a wide spectrum ranging from one gram, 500 milligrams to 125. Five days, one week, we have seen people being pulsed with methyl on one gram as early as th day three, and this being continued for at least a week in some instances when we receive transfers uh, at NHSL. So again, the thromboembolic disease, what is the do uh, prophylactic dose of enoxaparin? 40 milligrams SC daily. Uh, what is the intermediate dose, the so-called intermediate dose? Is it 40 SCBD or is it 60 SCBD? Uh, the therapeutic dose, of course, there is no not much confusion. Uh, 1.5 milligram per kilogram body weight uh, daily or 1 milligram per kilogram body weight BD. And mind you, these are in the absence of any uh, proven embolic uh, diseases uh, or, or radiological confirmation. Uh, so sometimes uh, if there is escalating needs for oxygen, if we have ex excluded other uh, other causes like uh, persistent uh, pneumo pneumonia, cytokine storm, uh, fluid overloads and other uh, parameters which may explain abnormal X-ray or CT scan, uh, and still the patient is hypoxemic, we may have to have a low threshold to start them on therapeutic doses of anticoagulation. Uh, so what's the best mode of treating hypoxemia and how important uh, role does hypoxemia play? So all these are uh, decisions that we have to uh, take in clinical practice. So self-proning, uh, how rigorously should we uh, uh, implement this? and strategies of mecha mechanical ventilation. What should our strategies be? When should we intervene? What should our, what sh when should we consider NIV failure or uh, CPAP uh, um, in, uh, pressure support PEEP, uh, which Afla will be talking to you later on. Uh, and is the uh, timing of this uh, different for these different phenotypes? Is it different for the L phenotype and the H phenotype? Uh, the, and which L, L, L phenotype which has uh, uh, increased work of breathing and which high ventilatory demands. So these are the, some of the issues that we as clinicians and chest physicians in particular uh, and intense ways also are faced with and we have to uh, grapple with this uh, and uh, make our decisions. So my first case is a 36, 7 year old male, hypertensive, but on, not on regular medication, non-smoker, two days fever, shortness of breath and exertion, dry, co dry cough and body aches and loose stools. In, this, in the second wave, we saw more GI symptoms and patients coming with more uh, loose stools and diarrhea. 
So 95% at rest on saturation, decreased on minimal exertion, uh, COVID PCR positive, same day work of breathing increased, uh, saturation dropped to 85% on an on rebreather 15 liters, uh, transferred to MICU, desaturated further and electively ventilated early. So these are the inflammatory parameters. You see a rising uh, high CRP, LDH which is 800, a high serum ferritin, D-dimer was not available at this time. Uh, the patient received 6 milligrams of uh, dexamethasone in oxyparin standard dose. Uh, later escalated to 40 BD and also tocilizumab, the IL-6 blocker. Uh, and then the patient was electively ventilated and intubated. Intubated and uh, electively ventilated. So that is the chronology of events that, uh, that happened. And the reason for be, uh, this patient being given tocilizumab uh, was that uh, rising oxygen demands, high CRP, rising ferritins, and rise, uh, high LDH levels. Uh, and also, now we have access to procalcitonin. We use, use this sometimes in instances to make sure there's, there's no sepsis. And if you have uh, suspicion of cardiac events, you, sh you look at your radiology, you can do bedside ultrasound cans to assess fluid status, um, the LV status, IVC, and then uh, you can make your decision on uh, tocilizumab. Again, there is some controversy whether some patients should get a second dose of tocilizumab, but there is no consensus on that as yet. So this patient uh, was extubated uh, and uh, uh, later on sent to the high dependency unit and on high flow oxygen, and then uh, we were able to step the patient, step down care and discharge the patient. Again, on discharge, uh, should this patient receive uh, some form of anticoagulation in terms of um, inoxiparin subcutaneous which the patient can be trained for or should we continue the uh, after 10 days of dexamethasone uh, should we um, de-escalate this and should we tail it off or could we stop it. Uh, so these are some of the issues that we uh, grapple with and sometimes practices are individualized. My second patient is a 66 year old female diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia fever of 5 days on admission desaturated. Uh, improved on 4 litre face mask, initially managed as non STEMI and heart failure with uh, standard management on CPAP 8, 8 to 10 centimeters water, red positive and PCR positive. So, again, uh, escalating oxygen demands, high CRP, fibrinogen high, D dimer high, LDH high, uh, ferritin high, uh, procalcitonin negative. So, patient went on to receive dexamethasone, inoxiparin, and tocilizumab uh, and uh, antibiotic cover with ceftriaxone. Uh, day 16 of the illness. Uh, patient should increase oxygen demands and had to be escalated to uh, high flow nasal oxygen, 70% uh, 60 liter flow rates and the dexamethasone was also increased. This is uh, a selection of her uh, CT scans which shows pneumopericardium, uh, pneumomediastinum. We have this, seen this co complication which is not infrequent. I have been wondering whether this initially when I was when I saw this patient I was wondering whether it could be due to a, uh, due to uh, PCJ or pneumocystis infection uh, because these patients are on heavy dose of steroids whether it could be the cause of this. Uh, later on uh, I was thinking whether staph uh, and pneumatoceles could cause this but further reading showed that patient with severe, uh, severe uh, COVID pneumonia uh, in which uh, diffuse alveolar damage alveolar can occur there is, there, there is alveolar rupture. So there is alveolar rupture and they are leaking into the interstitium and they are tracking along the bronchovascular bundles and uh, they are tracking along the bronchovascular bundles uh, to the mediastinum, pericardium, uh, and even subcutaneous emphysema uh, to the neck. So this problem is not infrequent, uh, and you have to be mindful that sometimes if you have uh, uh, pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium, uh, this patient can de develop tension pneumopericardium and tension uh, pneumomediastinum. So assessing this patient was uh, very the intense the, the, uh, critical care anesthesia SR who was with us at that time. Uh, during uh, the ward down, see does bedside ultrasounds and assesses the right ventricle to look for PE sometimes and also looking for uh, this complication of uh, pneumopericardium and uh, pneumomediastinum. Uh, sometimes you may palpate uh, subcutaneous emphysema. So this patient was managed with high flow nasal oxygen. Later on, the patient was pulsed with uh, methylprednisolone and went on to have uh, pred prednisolone as for uh, uh, COVID-induced organizing pneumonia. Patient was stable on two liters of uh, oxygen and was, we were able to transfer to the ward. Uh, these were uh, repeat X-ray CT scans of, on the 26th day of illness, which shows mainly ground glass changes and re resolving cord changes. The pneumomediastinum and the pneumopericardium have resolved. Again, these are measures shared by various clinicians, anesthetists in from various hospitals uh, of patients whom they have seen and they WhatsApp these images and have discussions on these. So this is what I said, this dark black blackness, the black 
uh, areas in the lung, uh, almost like air. Uh, uh, I have seen, I, I, if you see such things, uh, this is uh, associated with alveolar rupture and leak of air into the interstitium. So again, um, uh, I told about this and the contributed factors may be it can occur spontaneously in non-ventilated patients and patients on high flow oxygen also. Uh, these PA patients take in a long, large volume, they are, they are very hypoxemic, uh, they are, their oxygen demands are very high and they take in la large volumes of air and tran uh, trans pleural gradient builds up, builds up uh, giving rise to, uh, and these patients cough, they, they, they are on steroids, all this can contribute to alveolar rupture. Uh, so this is the radiology of it. Uh, sometimes uh, you may see a, a semi-circular semi uh, air crescent around the cardiac border. Uh, a better would be a lateral, a lateral x-ray, but it is not practical in situation where we are managing COVID patients in high dependency settings. So uh, as, uh, you have to be mindful of, of this complication of pneumomediastinum and pericardium in a patient who is de deteriorating uh, and the, the danger being that they can develop uh, tension pneumopericardium and pneumomediastinum. So during the second pandemic, uh, available case reports and records suggest a higher incidence of pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium uh, and the mortality in some say, case series have been as high as 87%. Uh, so this is another interesting patient, 56 year old, 57 year old man, previously healthy, had upper respiratory tract uh, infection 11 days back. Developed sudden onset pleuritic chest pain was admitted to a private sector hospital. Uh, COVID PCR negative. Uh, patient went on to have a video assisted thoracoscopy and a pleurectomy. Uh, because the lung looked abnormal, the surgeon biopsied the lung. The histology came as organizing pneumonia. Uh, he, had the uh, he had the usual history taking and uh, of our connective tissue diseases and other factors of organizing pneumonia, but those were all negative. ANA was negative. Uh, patient was not vaccinated. Uh, I went on to do the COVID antibody, which was more than 150, 150 plus. So, uh, and readings suggested that these pa some patients with COVID pneumonia develop a bullous kind of lung disease, where they, they, they develop lung bulla, which can rupture and give rise to pneumothorax. My third patient is a 67-year-old female, hypertensive uh, and asthma. A history of diarrhea three days, again, uh, standard care given as for COVID pneumonia, received tocilizumab because the inflammatory markers were high and oxygen demands were high. This was a uh, HRCT scan on day 14. Diffuse ground glass changes uh, extending to throughout the lung fields. This is a bit worrying. Uh, and when you look at that, uh, this kind of CT, uh, there are many possibilities that going through, through your mind. Is this fluid overload? Is this some, is this fluid overload? Uh, is this a secondary sepsis, but the changes are very diffuse and homogeneous. Uh, is this, is this, is this diffuse alveolar damage? Uh, is this uh, yeah, acute interstitial pneumonia? Or is this something like acute fibrinous pneumonia, which may manifest like a acute interstitial pneumonia or diffuse alveolar damage? So the patient's inflammatory markers were negative, procalcitonin were negative, uh, BNP um, and uh, cardiac troponins were negative. Uh, patients, if you, this is what I spoke, earlier has discussed with Afla Dilshan and many other people and they have also shared this. These people have on uh, small pressure supports, they, they have high tidal volumes. They have tidal, high tidal volumes, 850 thousands uh, sometimes and high uh, minute ventilations. So they have their hypoxemia is giving rise to uh, high demands of oxygen and such tidal volumes being delivered. Uh, in this uh, sense, it becomes uh, pertinent to think whether our bi-level devices that we use conventionally are able to uh, supply this kind of oxygen demands. Uh, mostly what we can give in the uh, machines that we use are about 40% and that also we have to monitor using with flow, which we'll hear later on, uh, with a flow meter of about uh, 15 liters per minute. So this, uh, are these changes uh, due to self-inflicted lung injury or silly patient uh, self-inflicted lung injury. Are we unnecessarily pulsing these patients with methylprednisone when, we, when our strategy should be early intubation, uh, supporting ventilation, correcting the hypoxemia? And uh, is this a particular phenotype? Because these patients, um, we see that we repeatedly pulse these patients, higher doses of steroids, thinking that it may be acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia. But uh, then again, uh, outcomes are not usually as good and maybe we should go for intubation early. So these are the phenotypes that I mentioned earlier, the L, the L phenotype, the H phenotype and the more fibrotic phenotype. So should, uh, should we consider uh, self-inflicted lung, lung injury seriously in this group of patients whom we are seeing in week two who have diffuse ground glass changes involving all, most all of their lung and are we unnecessarily uh, pulsing these patients with steroids? 
Uh, case four uh, is also, uh, it's a 24 year old female. I must thank Dr. Nyani Somasundaram for giving me this case. She was a patient who was admitted to the private sector, POA, 24 weeks, uh, myalgia, feeling unwell, four days. His father, father, her father had COVID pneumonia, was in the same hospital, but uh, she, didn't, uh, she hadn't mentioned this. Uh, so uh, the patient had very high oxygen demands, early intubated. Inoxiparin and the standard antibiotics uh, was given. She had her ferritins were not very high, uh, but uh, she went on to have tocilizumab. This is the chronology of her, of her events that occurred. Uh, chest x-rays by day, uh, on day six improved, oxygenation improved, patient were clinically better, uh, CRP, procalcitonin came down. Sometimes patient who received procalcitonin received tocilizumab, we see uh, CRP is less than 15. So, uh, patient was improving and uh, she had all the usual ventilator strategies, proning and things. Uh, patient developed a uh, high fever, 105, 106 fever, persistent fever. I don't know if it's clear on that graph, but patient had fever, severe fever and lebi very labile blood pressure, sometimes systolic pressure uh, shooting up to 200. So, we were wondering whether this could be a drug fever. Uh, and we were thinking of uh, chopping all the anti antibiotics also because at that stage the inflammatory markers procalcitonin was negative. Then Nani, uh, Nani went and read on this and she th thought it may be a hypothalamic injury uh, causing uh, this, this uh, uh, the fluctuations in blood pressure and, uh, and uh, temperatures that were uh, spiking over 106. So uh, she, we started the patient on bromocriptin. Patient didn't have that much muscle spasm but dantrolin was also given. But unfortunately, uh, patient on uh, on the uh, two days later, patient succumbed to her uh, illness, and the X-ray person she developed uh, sepsis. Uh, Procalcitonin went to went to eighty-four at that time. So these are challenging cases, uh, and when we read the literature, uh, we were able to find out uh, hypothalamic injury either due to direct viral in induced injury or microthrombi giving rise to uh, hypothalamic injury has been reported, all with hundred percent mortality. Right. So, in, in, in conclusion, uh, the challenges are multiple, uh, they are emerging and uh, our strategies must be accordingly evolve according to the ch challenges that are emerging. We cannot have a cookie cutter approach. Seneca will like this word, I think. <laughs> right. Uh, so, in all, because there are different phenotypes and different strategies are required. Uh, I feel it's important to share experiences, uh, bring in our own expertise in the, in the, in the fields that we practice, uh, learn from this experience, document and also, uh, also uh, uh, see that uh, practices uh, evolve with time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amita Fernando. Um, as for the questions, we shall take the questions at the end of the session. Uh, please do send them in. Uh, the, our next speaker is Dr. Afla Siddiqin. He's, he's also a consultant respiratory physician at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. He will be talking about talking to us about targeting the target saturation, the use of NIV and high flow nasal oxygen in COVID pneumonia. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Senekar Rajapaksa, President of College of Physicians, and uh, Dr. Geeta Pereira, College of Pulmonology, uh, Sri Lanka College of Pulmonology uh, President, for giving me this opportunity. So we heard a very elaborative and uh, very informative talk from Dr. Amit Fernando. So uh, when it comes to ventilation and oxygenation, uh, it's uh, something we are really looking forward to uh, do for those severely ill or severe COVID pneumonia. So before I start talk about ventilator strategies, we should know a little bit of hypoxemia, hypoxemia in COVID, as well as uh, I'll be just uh, briefing about the targets we are, how we are going to uh, work out, and uh, how what the respiratory support we are going to use on those patients to improve the oxygen levels and the strategies and the challenges when we uh, manage those cases with non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygen. So we have been hearing about hypoxemia and uh, this happy hypoxia for the last one and a half years or so, and uh, especially when their saturation level is less than 90, sometimes they feel all right and they are well tolerated. They think that it is because of the normal lung tissue around those uh, affected areas are having a good compliance and uh, they are uh, uh, not experiencing that kind of that uh, uh, symptom, uh, symptoms at that level. So, however, 
when there is a uh, minor exertion, this in, uh, the uh, intrapulmonary shunt over those uh, affected areas will cause severe hypoxemia and severe desaturation. To understand uh, the hypoxemia, it is important to know how it evolves uh, over the uh, course of the illness. It is not only just to understand about the symptoms and the um, pathophysiology, also it is important to understand about the treatment modalities and when it comes to oxygen therapy and uh, ventilator strategy for those patients. So we heard from the from previous speaker and uh, how those uh, um, uh, stages are important, but I would uh, f focus on the stage where the desaturation starts with the intrapulmonary shunting, where with edema and atelectasis uh, with intravascular microthrombi, and where by, by the time patient develops symptoms, uh, patient already has started developing reduced lung compliance and also uh, increased consolidation at lactasis. And must not remember these patients become more anxious and they become more fatigued. That itself causes further uh, deterioration of the lung um, uh, the compliance and the ventilation when it comes to increased work of breathing. So it is important not only just to know how the pathophysiology also at which level how we are going to intervene for the management of these patients. So though we know about 80% of our patients are mild or moderate illness, some of uh, more, more about 20-15% of those patients require oxygen and 5% will be critically ill. And all, out of those, 75% uh, need uh, uh, classified as severely ill or even 25% of them becomes critical. So that means they need uh, some kind of ventilator support in addition to the oxygen supplementation. We have seen over the last uh, uh, months and so on over the, over the world how the oxygen demand has gone up and uh, when, it, uh, 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 when it comes to Sri Lanka, I think we are also not lagging behind. So to uh, understand why we want to give oxygen, we should know at which point um, um, we, we are thinking of um, uh, giving oxygen by classifying these patients moderate and severe. So uh, in moderate patients, they may not have very mild, mild symptoms. However, they may have uh, just x imaging changes uh, in, involving some kind of changes where you may have, may not consider this as severe COVID pneumonia. However, when the oxygen demand goes up, that means you are, sub, you are with, um, uh, supplying oxygen with the uh, uh, maximum uh, oxygen uh, concentration where uh, uh, saturation is still 90% and less than 90% or even the saturation is less than 94% on room air but your work of breathing and the respiratory rate is high and the chest x is showing multi-lobar pattern or even the blood gases may show a, a PF ratio less than 300 where you have to categorize this as severe. And if the uh, undoubtedly, if the hemodynamically, if the patient is unstable, then of course we have to consider that severe. So identifying these patients will lead you to decide what kind of oxygen support or respiratory support we are going to give. So the the tricky part is when the oxygen demand or the flow rate is more than ten, and uh, we consider this as uh, patients are going towards severe disease where they need a reservoir mask and provide high flow oxygen. And uh, then the next uh, level of uh, oxygen supplementation with the ventilator support is going to be a, a challenge. So identifying those patients uh, and uh, deciding on what oxygen flow rate uh, to achieve uh, FIO2, um, to, to achieve a, a target saturation more than 94, uh, you should know how much of fractionated oxygen we are giving. Of course, each one has its own pros and cons and uh, it is, we should be mindful when we are applying any of these uh, strategies to manage. So, non-invasive uh, uh, respiratory support is something we have been talking about throughout in, the, uh, in, in this pandemic. It always a, a challenge a clinician to decide how and when to escalate when the oxygen demand goes. So that is where the non-invasive uh, uh, strategies come into play. And why we think of non-invasive is to make sure that 
uh, the our goal to avoid or need in phase in mechanical ventilation uh, which is can be uh, uh, with a high mortality rate so we have commonly two strategies that is the CPAP or NIV and the high flow nasal oxygen having said that we need to understand though it is a good uh, strategy to use these uh, uh, ventilator support or uh, oxygen uh, supplementation you need to understand we can cause harm to for the patient's management by delaying the tracheal intubation or even exacerbating lung injury also increasing the nosocomial infection so though there are there is a big uh, interest on uh, use of non invasive mechanical ventilation and high flow nasal cannula there is a wide variation all over the world of use either each strategy so when they did a, a study on uh, in 85 countries they found that there is a, a, a wide variation and later they found that this balance of harm and benefit result at this variation so to make a clear understanding and evidence based approach by using uh, uh, non invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygen for those severe covid pneumonia there is an ongoing trial uh, where the recovery uh, respiratory support uh, group is uh, uh, conducting to understand the uh, strategies using CPAP high flow and uh, with the standard care. It's a randomized control, open label, multi center uh, effectiveness trial. I'm sure that will give a lot of um, information in the coming months for us to how evidence based approach we are going to uh, take up. In these patients so we heard about the uh, different types of uh, uh, covid pneumonia patients where the lung damage is in progression uh, it is not necessary that every all those patients go through from l type to h type but however these patients an understanding of each uh, type can give you some insight what sort of ventilatory strategy or in oxygen as a strategy we should use uh, to improve the outcome. So we heard about L-type where the elastins, uh, lung weight and the recruitability is low when it comes for H-type where the elastins, lung weight and recruitability is high. So uh, there is a, 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 there is a, a study which uh, there was a study which was done by Gattinoni by and the group uh, to find out who will benefit, how they will benefit on, on each um, uh, type. However, high number of patients in a pandemic it is not it may not be practically possible to select each person and to decide on the uh, ventilator or uh, respiratory strategy however he demonstrated that l typers respond um, uh, uh, they uh, they respond well for, by correcting hypoxia by increasing uh, fio2 in but when they are not breathless but when they are really breathless, they have to be opted for uh, high flow and or NIV. When there is evidence where you have these patients are transforming from L type to H type or they are in the H type, risk of lung injuries is high and the early intubation has to be considered. And also he pointed out that uh, if the patient is H type at the beginning, there has to be some uh, early intervention with uh, intubation. Uh, uh, applying higher PEEP and also early proning and maybe they, they will benefit from ECMO. However, there are people who are not uh, very much um, uh, convinced with this uh, uh, theory and the strategy. And we, but still we have to stick to high flow and NIV uh, ventilation, uh, non-invasive ventilation strategy. When it comes to high flow nasal oxygen therapy, the uh, the studies have proven and uh, uh, from a multi-center perspective observation study that uh, it is a, a very practically feasible uh, approach uh, to supply, uh, give high flow nasal oxygen in this patient and also uh, it is um, almost half of those, those patients they have studied found that uh, 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 was able to avoid mechanical ventilation. Of course they used the uh, ROXCO as one of those uh, uh, to decide uh, the failure of uh, high flow for intubation. But uh, uh, we all know that uh, this CO is not the ideal uh, because the, it was studied and applied for uh, those patients who were used NIV in 
COPD and CO2 retention patient. So we need to understand when you give high flow, it's uh, about both in, uh, in expiration and inspiration to increase the alveolar recruitment and also the in expiration, the PEEP effect, uh, which will improve the oxygenation and also it will decrease the work of breathing uh, ultimately to decrease the uh, minute, ventilation, minute ventilation and respiratory rate. So by using the high flow nasal oxygen, we are in addition to improving all those things what I have said, also it is the humidification which is going to make patient more comfortable and compliant. So probably um, uh, the role of microatelectasis in those patients also are contributing uh, to by improving the microatelectasis to uh, decrease the work of breathing. The high flow nasal oxygen is has been used in the ICU by now we use high flow nasal oxygen in HDU uh, uh, quite often, and we have found that the some of some uh, that some of the strategies we have used for high flow nasal oxygen is not the uh, ideal. And we need to understand uh, when we use high flow nasal oxygen, we uh, we have to use the same strategy we use for NIV in terms of infection prevention control measures. And the patient should wear a mask and should ask. Uh, the to breathe through the nose and uh, if, if it is possible we have to always look into these patients uh, or look into the uh, look into the another in the vent, uh, ventilator strategy to give uh, use intermittently and also we must listen to the patient's requirement as well so one thing we must not forget the uh, to uh, know the hospital capacity of oxygen supply especially when we set up uh, high flow nasal oxygen in many high flow use many when we use many high flow nasal oxygen in, in units because uh, we don't want the uh, hospital to run out of oxygen so when we start we can always start with 30 liters per minute and we can increase the 60 liters per minute the flow rate but however when we receive patients we receive with high work of breathing and uh, 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 oxygen demand is very high, so we may end up with starting with uh, 60 liters per minute and uh, to uh, maintain the target saturation. When we select the um, uh, catheter, we must make sure that their uh, diameter should be 50% or less from the size uh, the, the patient's nostril uh, nostrils. So. Uh, Always, when because these patients are agitated, anxious, and uh, they'll be always uh, turning around, so must always the, uh, to ensure that the connectivity of the tubing to prevent leaks. And if we have achieved our target saturation, it is important to uh, measure, uh, monitor every two hours and also to detect early deterioration. And when we uh, start high flow nasal oxygen and uh, first we have to place the nasal cannula, then place in the mask, then only you start the flow because this will minimize the aerosolization and uh, uh, um, uh, infection uh, into the uh, inf getting infected by the uh, healthcare providers. And also when we stop, uh, we have to find uh, do the same routine in a reverse manner. Now the weaning of high flow nasal oxygen has been always uh, spoken about, but uh, we must understand when we reduce or uh, we, when we wean off high flow nasal oxygen, first we need to reduce the FiO2 before the flow rate. Some people they prefer to reduce both, but uh, gradually, maybe um, uh, by five or ten. So, however, must not bring down the flow rate at once uh, by keeping up the FiO2. Now. The, when it comes to non-invasive ventilation, the, this paper uh, analysis from the uh, HOPE COVID-19 registry showed that the, more than half of the patients survived without need of intubation. And also in that um, uh, registry, they found that uh, it was um, uh, a good strategy to use uh, to, to improve the um, morbidity and mortality of those patients when, when there is a limited intensive care resources. But it is important also, they have mentioned that it is important to identify the failures and to avoid harm. And uh, that is something what I will be talking in the next couple of slides. So uh, 
uh, we need to understand when it comes for NIV, what strategy we are going to use or what mode of mode we are going to use with a CPAP or BiPAP, uh, bi-level ventilation, depending on the type of failure. So when it comes to uh, selecting, we need to know the double lumen and it has to be a non-vented. If we don't have a double lumen, then of course a single tubing uh, 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 has to be single tubing with the exhalation port and the viral filter also has to be connected a correct uh, place. So the understanding about the uh, interface is something very important because if it is not well fitted, with the leak will cause more harm and the uh, you may not be able to pick up the deterioration until the patient is really hypoxic. So you can start up the pressure from, from eight uh, onwards, but uh, you have to be really mindful when the patient is on because some of these patients will remain with CPAP for sometimes few days. So you have to be really mindful about the viral filter to change and also the, the these filters will get wet and it will reduce the gas flow. So this is just uh, uh, to show that uh, how those um, interfaces are and the exhalation port with the filter is fitted and uh, how what uh, the, the, the because it is quite important to fit in the correct way. If not, there will be uh, the, the use of uh, the especially the exhalation port, port and the, uh, the filters is uh, no use. And now see this is a, 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 a patient who's on um, severe hypoxemia. So this patient was on 70% uh, oxygen or FiO to a 0.7 and he, she, she's on um, uh, uh, CPAP uh, and you see the PO2 with all that is 68.5, but PO ratio is 97.9. So it shows that, but still patient is seated, comfortable, and they tolerate well. So this is something we need to understand about COVID severe COVID pneumonia. With this degree of hypoxemia, they tolerate well uh, with the uh, non-invasive ventilation. So what is, how do we predict whether this patient will um, uh, success uh, will go through the NIV. Of course, there is no, um, you know, data, uh, um, uh, fully full, full uh, evidence to suggest that these are the parameters we should look for. But even the group in Russia, they found that when the, with the higher minute ventilation on the very first day, when you connect to the NIV, is not a good sign. And also, they found CRP and D-dimer at the onset uh, when it is low, uh, they are. Uh, success rate is high, uh, also the PCO2 levels. But uh, some uh, authors, they felt that uh, the PO2 FiO2 ratio, that is PF ratio, is a good indicator for us to uh, assess the success or the failure. But however, in this paper, they showed that there is no difference uh, to suggest that PF ratio is going to give you any uh, answer about the success or failure of NIV. So we heard a lot about the alveolar damage. Now we all know that the physiological response for hypoxemia is by increasing the respiratory rate and that is increasing the minute uh, ventilation and the increase in the tidal volume. This initial injury with the uh, virus, there is a capillary leakage and there is a local and gradually uh, uh, spreading pulmonary edema or what we call pulmonary damage which causes impairment of the gas exchange and uh, change of respiratory mechanics. Now, when we, uh, when the uh, infection uh, settles in, when the inflammation settles in, there is a um, uh, increased respiratory drive, further cause pleural uh, pressures and swings, and this is just a vicious cycle. This is the uh, a simple way of uh, explanation for uh, patient-induced uh, or uh, self-induced lung injury. So this is uh, something we have not attended much, uh, we have not given much focus, but however, this is a very important mechanism to understand when we uh, use non-invasive ventilation for those patients uh, who need high oxygen demand. So, uh, we also need to understand when you give NIV, we are uh, giving a, a tidal volume, sometime it may contribute for this uh, self-induced lung injury, and that we heard about this interst uh, interstitial uh, emphysema and which lead to alveolar rupture and then lead to uh, pneumomediastinum. 
pneumothorax, subcutis emphysema. We have seen quite a lot of patients, in quite a lot of patients, and these some patients ended up with repeated um, uh, IC tubes. So that itself will cause further lung damage. So that is, this is a vicious cycle we will be just um, uh, going on, especially when the patient is on uh, in IV. Not only just in IV, even with the minor intravalvular pressure changes, maybe with the, just a recruitment maneuver, or coughing, or ventilatory asynchrony, agitation, restlessness, that it will also cause further alveolar damage. So I would want to, just with my um, 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 uh, understanding, I felt that there are a few tips we have to focus on uh, those patients who need, uh, uh, who is using NIV in high oxygen demand. So what we need to understand is about the devices. Right. If you know, don't know about the devices properly, we may cause more harm. And also, if the, there are so many um, uh, brands or the different makes that the use or the, the, the settings can, may, can give uh, difficulties or uh, setting up, so that can cause further um, uh, injury. So you have to have a better understanding. And also, we heard about the flow rate. So the, the standard flow rates we have on the uh, uh, wall oxygen or even using the jumbo oxygen cylinder is about 15 liters per minute and uh, the, the higher oxygen demand in those severe COVID pneumonia patients is something uh, uh, not going to uh, benefit from this 15 liter uh, flow rate. So we need a higher um, flow rate devices. Uh, now we have uh, come across 26, even 30 liters per minute where we can use for NIV. Now, there is a very big hype about using home devices, but it is not going to do any better. In fact, it will do harm for those patients with high oxygen demand. And uh, using the viral filter and expiry report in the correct manner, also using the uh, correct interface for the maximum benefit and to reduce the leak. And also you need to understand, we need to monitor closely to, and to detect failure by uh, not trying to do harm by doing experiments. So it's at the end of the day, the success depends on the patient's selection and also uh, application at the correct time to detect the, uh, the failure. Or, and also, uh, when you compare the high flow and nasal oxygen, I'm not going to go into details. However, the, uh, the comfort and the the monitoring with the um, sorry the, the maintaining the humidification is something giving a benefit for those patients with high flow nasal oxygen. But of course, with NIV, you are giving a peep. Uh, where we, we can improve the ventilation and the oxygenation easily. So at the end, what I want to mention is we need to clearly imagine when we uh, deal with a patient with severe COVID pneumonia, whom to intubate and whom to ventilate non-invasively. So supplementation of oxygen is not the only answer for progressive desaturation. Yes, CPAP or the NIV and high flow is a good option, but it should not delay for your intubation and minute ventilation. And at the end of the day, for a successful uh, uh, patient recovery, it's not the, just the uh, NIV support or the oxygen supplementation. It's also the other um, medication we heard about, use of IL-6, that's tocilizumab, corticosteroids, and anticoagulation. Thank you. Thank you, Afra, for that detailed uh, description of uh, how to target saturation. The next speaker for today is Dr. Amila Ratnapala. He's a consultant respiratory physician from the National Hospital of Kandy, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, he will be joining us online, and his uh, speech is going to be on the evidence-based medicine and the COVID-19, what to believe and, and when to change. Over to you, Amila. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, could you please tell me, can you hear me? Go on. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so today I'm going to discuss about evidence-based medicine and what to believe and what when to change. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Ceylon College of Physicians as well as the uh, Sri Lanka College of Pharmacology for the invitation. Uh, so first of all, I'll discuss about these are standard prescription that we see in a, a patient with a crit coid 
and uh, you can see the polypharmacy because of the multiple comorbid conditions and presents on a lot of vitamins as well as steroids and anticoagulation. And we'll see how to implement evidence-based medicine on our COVID patients. So today I'll be discussing uh, predominantly about the impact of pandemic and on the knowledge translation. And uh, I'll be discussing about the time critical and information light decisions. And I'll be going through some brainstorming uh, session on, uh, on clinical trials. And then I'll be discussing about the way forward uh, from this epidemic. So first of all, evidence-based medicine is uh, explicit usage of uh, published evidence and uh, on clinical decision making in relevant patients. At the same time, we should value the patient preferences as well as patient values. So there are three pillars in uh, evidence-based medicine. First is the relevant published uh, evidence. And number two is the clinical judgment, when to use it, when not to use it, and then about the patient values as well as the patient preferences. If you go for the traditional models of knowledge translation, you know that identifying a clinical problem and then uh, designing a study, going through the literature and then uh, performing either observational or interventional study, uh, followed by uh, analysis and then a publication, and then there's a peer reviewing process. This knowledge generation or knowledge translation has been challenged by the pandemic because of this rapidity of development of symptoms and the criticalness of the disease. Um, the, the best example uh, is a story of hydroxychloroquine. I think everybody knows about that. If you go through the timelining of uh, the hydroxychloroquine, you know, the 3rd of March, there, would be a pub, there was a pilot study published in Google document, uh, which involved about 30 patients. They, they found there's some benefit in COVID pneumonia and followed by, there are multiple uh, comments from politicians. It was uh, published in the media, newspaper and social media. And ultimately, within about two to three weeks, the FDA has been given EU emergency use authorization for this chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And then what happened actually, there were multiple trials came recovery, solidarity, and many trials, we found there was no benefit at all uh, in uh, continuing hydroxychloroquine. So ultimately in 15th of June, FDA retracts its emergency use authorization for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. This is a classical example. When we are not using our EBM or evidence-based medicine, these things can happen in a pandemic situation. So if we consider therapeutic decision-making, there are multiple factors are involved in. For example, there are personal values are involved in, as well as where we stand in the decision-making hierarchy. And also not only the critical appraisal of the evidence, but also our perception of potential benefit versus risk. For example, we know that in case of uh, certain drugs like dexamethasone or tocilizumab, there will be benefit of, uh, of about four to five percent when compared to the control alarm. But still, we believe that uh, they are kind of uh, excellent drugs. So we tend to overuse because our perception of potential benefits are more than the risk. As well as we are considering some about the economics and also when you come to a patient, when, you, when a patient uh, confront with us, uh, basically we come to a place where therapeutically we become unhelpless. For example, in a pandemic, it's a new disease. We don't have much evidence-based medicine initially. Therefore, we try to give polypharmacy. Our intention is to cure the patient, but sometimes we do more harm than the benefit. So therefore, the pandemic has pushed up uh, ask for uh, time critical decisions at the same time we are lacking evidence and information light. So I'll go uh, uh, with uh, the available evidence as well as the common practices in our, our country. And uh, so basically I'll be talking about the supplements. First of all, you know, vitamin C has been widely used in COVID patients. Um, and uh, the pathophysiological basis or rationale of this as an antioxidant or free radical scavenger that is that has anti-inflammatory properties in infections. However, <clears throat> so based on that, I think we have changed our practice. We have given loads and loads of vitamin C to patients. For example, in my personal experience, we know that a young lady was given vitamin C and ultimately found that she has continuous metabolic acidosis with the high anion gap. We could not find the cause and we stop ascorbic acid vitamin C and then it has resolved. So it might do more harm. But it, this has been studied in a clinical trial. This is published in JAMA. 
this is for the ambulatory patients or outpatients or mild patients the trial has been done in 256 patients they have given oral ascorbic acid 8000 mg in zinc gluconate as well as both agents uh, versus standard standard of care but ultimately i'd like to stress the fact that this study was terminated due to futility after 40% of the uh, data collection because they found there's no benefit at all and there are some harm if you consider the critical ill patients there is a pilot study done in china they have given very high dose of vitamin C, IV vitamin C, 24 grams daily for seven days. So this placebo studied in 56 patients. And then they, they concluded that there's no difference in the outcome, particularly 28 day mortal. But when you study this uh, RCT, and if you go for this Kaplan-Meier curves that you can see clearly that the uh, 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 IV vitamin C causing more deaths than the control group. So therefore, I mean, we have changed our practice according to uh, our previous experience, but the clinical trials came out and we now we know actually that it is causing more harm. It, when it comes to vitamin D, again, that we know the physiologically and uh, it is uh, potentially uh, modulating the innate and adaptive immune responses. Uh, this has been studied in a retrospective study for six years in India, there are two arms, asymptomatic as well as in ICU patients, they have studied the vitamin D deficiencies. Remember, this is in publishing nature scientific reports and is an observational study. And what they found is the vitamin D deficiency was significantly higher in patients who are critically ill in ICUs compared to the patients um, uh, who are asymptomatic where their vitamin D deficiency was not uh, lacking. Well, we have changed our practice. We thought um, vitamin D will be a miracle. And we, we have prescribed almost all the patients with uh, COVID in certain cases, very high doses. But especially even though that is published in Nature, that there was significant limitation. It is a single center study. And also they have not evaluated the uh, duration of the disease from symptom onset. And basically there are a lot of bias created by this study because they have not evaluated the comorbid conditions, particularly they have not evaluated diabetes, obesity, as well as ischemic heart disease. So there are many confounding factors for this study, which led to a wrong perception, and we ultimately changed our practice to give vitamin D. Then <clears throat> this RCT published in JAMA in 7th, 7th of uh, February 2021. So they as they, uh, they ask the same question, they hypothesize vitamin D supplementation will improve the survival. This is a multi-center, double-blind, randomized placebo-controlled trial. And this has been studied in 250, 240 patients with uh, COVID who are moderately severe uh, COVID. And they have given a mega dose of vitamin D of 200,000 units, and then compared with the placebo. Ultimately, there's no difference in the primary outcome, which is there's no uh, mortality benefit as well as there's no change in the hospital uh, stay. So if you further uh, study these uh, curves that you can see that there's no significant benefit when compared to the placebo by giving uh, vitamin D. The main alarming factor is that even that patients with uh, vitamin D deficiency, still there's no benefit by giving a mega dose of vitamin D uh, according to this uh, trial published in the JAMA. So we have changed our practice according to the observation studies, but when the RCT comes, we know the real uh, question. When we have control studies, we know that the answers are different. The next is the steroids and COVID-19. There are many burning questions for us uh, between steroid about steroids. Basically, what is optimum timing to initiate steroids? What is the best steroid? And what is the duration? What is the optimum dose? Again, this <clears throat> retrospective analysis, this cohort study, uh, they have found that uh, in the steroid term, they have actually, this study was conducted uh, in patients with radiological evidence of COVID pneumonia, but they are not hypoxic. That means they are in the either in stage one, viremic phase, or stage 2A. Most of the patients were in stage 2A. And uh, then they have the primary outcome was actually 12.7% of the patients went on developing severe disease, whereas only one patient or 1.8% patients 
uh, from the control arm developed CVD. So we found that there's a harm giving steroids in patients who are not hypoxic, as well as patients, even though patients have radiological evidence of pneumonia. If you start, if you uh, go through this curve that you can see that the patients with, uh, uh, patients who are treated with uh, steroids and uh, uh, who are kind of the cumulative rate of non-severe patients were actually higher in the control arm than in the uh, steroid arm. So in fact, introducing steroid in the early phase of the disease could cause more harm. But again, uh, do, I mean, do we have to change uh, uh, our practice? But there are significant uh, limitations of the study because the study was primarily, I mean, steroid therapy was selected preferentially for patients who, are, who had more risk factors for severe disease. So when it comes to uh, this landmark clinical trial from the recovery group, Dexamethasone on in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. This is a, a multi-center study, randomized open-label label adaptive trial in patients with uh, COVID-19, and they have studied about 6,425 patients. The key inclusion criteria was a hospitalized patient who are having clinically suspect or laboratory confirmed uh, 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 COVID, as well as they have excluded patients with potentially uh, harmful steroid therapies. They have used uh, dexamethasone six milligram per orally or IV once daily uh, versus standard of, standard of care for 10 days duration. And the primary endpoint was all cause mortality at 20 days after randomization. In this study, again, when you go through this forest plot, this is in the supplementary material that we know when you give steroids less than seven days, the, you can see it is the, the benefits are less, it seems, even though that is not statistically significant, but it is towards the usual care. But if you give steroids for the patients for more than seven days from the symptom onset, it clearly shows a benefit. So this is one of the alarming uh, finding of this uh, clinical trial. We should not give steroids early in the disease, especially when these patients are viremic. Then again, this forest plot that we have studied patients who are given oxygen and who are not given oxygen. And clearly that when we give steroids, patients who are not given oxygen, it causes more harm. You can see it is in the other side of the forest plot. But if you give uh, dexamethasone or steroids in uh, patients who are hypoxic, there is a clear evidence of benefit. So what is the best steroid or optimum dose and the duration? Again, the, after this study, this has been published in a meta-analysis, published again in JAMA in September 2020, where they have analyzed many clinical trials, including this uh, recovery trial on dexamethasone. If you come <coughs> across all the steroid type, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, methylprednisone, remember, that the, according to this, the main benefit comes from dexamethasone. I mean, even the other steroids, there is a benefit, but if you consider the number of patients in these clinical trials, they are far more or less, and the most of the weight came from the recovery. Therefore, uh, dexamethasone has more power in this meta-analysis. But however, there is trend of benefit even in other uh, steroids, but clearly dexamethasone shows the most benefit as a steroid in, when it comes to COVID. And the low dose versus high dose. Uh, the recovery has been studied six milligram daily uh, or, or orally or intravenously from day, from ten, for 10 days duration. Clearly, it, it carries the more weight for this meta analysis, therefore, the benefit is more. But there are two trials the CODEX as well as DEXA COVID 19 trial. They studied high dose uh, dexamethasone, that is 20 milligram daily for five days duration with 10 milligram daily for five days duration. And both these studies actually, they showed some benefit, but even though they are not statistically significant and the number of patients are very low. So therefore we have some signal that there may be a benefit uh, in uh, a higher dose dexamethasone in selective patients, but still this is widely studied in a recovery arm. Now they're recruiting patients for this study. So uh, when to select high dose uh, dexamethasone, particularly we have some uh, freedom to think about that, but still for the time being, the standard of care is six milligram daily, but there's some signal from these small scale uh, uh, RCTs that 
even higher dose of dexamethasone can be considered in certain subset of patients. Next is the tocilizumab. We know it is the IL-6 and receptor antagonist, and uh, we are widely using tocilizumab in our practice, and uh, we should know who will benefit the most and what is the optimum timing for this drug and what is the place for second dose. This again starting coming from a recovery arm published in uh, May 2000, uh, 2021 in Lancet. And uh, <clears throat> it's an open level randomized controlled platform trial assessing several treatments in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. For example, they have studied about 4,116 patients, nearly about 19% of all recovery trial participants. The inclusion criteria was, I mean, they have recruited all the patients uh, within 21 days from the day of randomization, and they have only recruited patients who are hypoxic as evident by saturation less than 92% on rheumia or on supplementary oxygen. And also they have used this CRP more than 75, and we are not uh, yet clear why they have used this uh, arbitrary 75 value, but they have used this criteria uh, as an inclusion criteria uh, for this uh, tocilizumab study. And they have, remember, they have excluded all the patients who are having active co-infections with tuberculosis or any other bacterial, fungal, or viral infection. That is very important that we should exclude uh, patients with other infections. <clears throat> they have intervened with single-dose tocilizumab. In certain patients, actually, they have given a second dose uh, of tocilizumab after 24 to, uh, 12 to 4, 24 hours later. The primary endpoint was uh, all cause mortality in 28 days, and then secondary endpoint was to assess the time to discharge alive and uh, time uh, to not to intubate these patients. Again, the primary outcome was positive, and uh, the mortality on day 21 was lower in tocilizumab above compared in the control arm, as you can see with these charts. And uh, in the subgroup analysis that we found that uh, among those who required mechanical ventilation at baseline, mortality was quite similar in the uh, tocilizumab arm versus the usual arm. So that means that we are very doubtful whether uh, critical ill patients who are requiring me mechanical ventilation, whether there's any benefit at all by giving tocilizumab from the recovery study alone. <clears throat> uh, again, that I'd like to highlight these points in the supplementary analysis of this uh, uh, tocilizumab study, recovery study, that most of the benefits are found in early disease. I mean, when we consider early when the patients are going into the inflammatory phase and when the CRPs are rising early. So this is more beneficial early in the disease and then the later part of the disease. And this is very important again. Almost all the patients who are on, uh, who are given tocilizumab, they benefited while they were on steroids. If they are not on steroids, actually giving tocilizumab alone can cause more harm than benefit uh, when you're using tocilizumab. <clears throat> Again, this uh, remap cap group, they have studied uh, tocilizumab in critical ill patients because you know that in the recovery that uh, there's a poor signal again, critical ill patients. Therefore, this study is a multinational RCT in critical ill patients. They have studied about 865 patients. They have uh, included actually patients uh, who are admitted to ICU and uh, receiving uh, respiratory and cardiovascular support. They have excluded patients on uh, immunosuppression as well as liver enzymes more than five times. And also they have in only included patients within 24 hours for this study. Again, you can see in hospital mortality, was, uh, 20, there's a positive signal, 28% for the treatment arm and compared to the 35% for patients receiving a standard of care. Not only that, the ICE, the, the, uh, the uh, patients who requiring organ support free days were more in the tocilizumab. Even in this study, they have used second dose of tocilizumab in certain group of patients, but that has been not evaluated uh, properly. It has been not uh, disseminated properly. So therefore, we don't have any uh, idea about uh, the use of second dose of uh, tocilizumab in these both trials, because that I feel they have not adequately powered that to come to a conclusion. But when you come to the systemic analysis of systemic review and meta-analysis on tocilizumab in patients, which is alarming, there are multiple studies, prospective studies, retrospective studies, as well as there are uh, multiple RCTs has been done in these patients, but only recovery and recap map has been shown some benefit. Why is that? So it is alarming. It has been widely used in COVID, but only two studies were given uh, positive evidence. And not only that, 
all these clinical trials, as well as the retrospective, as well as prospective studies, they found the significant uh, uh, risk of infection, secondary infection. You can see the forest plot here. It is uh, going more than one, and it, it favors the control. So uh, patients who are receiving tocilizumab, there's a significant risk of uh, bacterial infection. So again, when you come to practice that we know uh, why there are a lot of discrepancies in these studies. So one is the designing of the study. Number one, we should be aware that tocilizumab should be only given in the context of corticosteroids. When they are not on steroids, we should not give tocilizumab because it can cause more harm. And there's a limited therapeutic window from the, uh, from the uh, recovery trial. We know that it is early disease about average about seven to 12 days that we should consider tocilizumab as well as from the recap map study we know within the first 24 hours of your ICU admission, we should consider tocilizumab. That is the therapeutic window for tocilizumab. And there should be explicit criteria by using uh, procalcitonin and culture, we should exclude any bacterial infection, any viral or fungal infection at any cost before we consider tocilizumab in our patients. So that is the reason for this diversity. About the second dose, as I said, I mean, what I understood from the published data on tocilizumab, mainly from the recovery, as well as from the uh, recap map studies that they are not adequately powered for these analysis of the second dose. But this retrospective analysis came from uh, another journal that is there any additional benefit of multiple dosing tocilizumab in COVID patients. So even though this is a retrospective analysis, they have studied about 50 patients in single dose and 20, uh, 31 patients in multiple doses. And they found that uh, all cause mortality in uh, two studies and uh, there's no significant benefit. In fact, actually, the patients who were on uh, multiple dose of tocilizumab has a slightly higher uh, uh, mortality than the single dose tocilizumab. So therefore, uh, again, these are retrospective analysis and we should not change our behavior completely based on this retrospective analysis. But for the time being, we do not have uh, conclusive evidence to use second dose of tocilizumab for patients with critically, uh, critical illnesses. The next I'll be discussing about the anticoagulation. Uh, again, uh, the role of anticoagulation, it came from this study. It is a meta-analysis in hos uh, hospital patients with COVID-19. We found that their overall VTE, venous thromboembolism prevalence was about 15%. Especially in ICU patients, it was around 22%. The average, we are talking about 15 to 30% cases of venous thromboembolism in patients with COVID pneumonia who are admitted to our uh, hospital setup. So therefore, there were so many studies and this retrospective analysis published in Journal of American College of Cardiology in July, 2020, it is a retrospective, I would like to uh, uh, evaluate, I would like to emphasize that it's a retrospective analysis, which has been, uh, which has been uh, studied association of treatment dose anticoagulation versus uh, uh, standard uh, prophylaxis treatment in survival of patients with COVID-19. This uh, diagram, this figure is amazing. You can see when you consider the treatment of those uh, anticoagulation that it shows clearly a benefit uh, in survival, for example, in all cause mortality, but in uh, especially if you consider patients who require mechanical ventilation, there are significant benefit when you consider treatment dose uh, anticoagulation for these patients. But if you analyze this study again, are you going to believe? Yes, I think most of our practices have changed. We initially given therapeutic dose of anticoagulation for most of our patients, irrespective of their evidence of either thromboembolism or not. And, but the problem is there are significant limitations on this study because it didn't, it lacked the details of patient characteristics. There are no, there are no uh, indications for anticoagulation has been mentioned. And also they have not mentioned about the comorbid conditions uh, of these patients. Therefore, there are significant selection bias in these patients, actually, uh, the, which might have affected the outcome of these uh, patients. Therefore, we have the hypothesis, okay, the therapeutic anticoagulation could help in our patients. This is being studied in multi-platform RCT. The three RCTs at the same time, the ATAACC, REMAC-CAP, as well as ACTIVE-4A. All these three trials are assessing the same uh, 
uh, a hypothesis in their clinical trials and we have the interim analysis. Remember that they have, uh, there are two arms, the patients with moderate DS and severe state DS actually who are requiring ICU. But unfortunately, the severe state disease, the studies has been terminated due to futility. They, they, they found that patients who are on mechanical ventilation due to COVID pneumonia, they have higher risk of death when you give uh, a therapeutic dose of anticoagulation when there's no suspicion of uh, thromboembolism or when there's no, no demonstra demonstrable thrombosis in these patients. So this arm of these trials has been terminated due to fertility. But we found some superiority uh, in patients with low d timer with moderate uh, uh, disease, but again, the odds ratio is not significant. And again, with high D-dimer, we found superiority in the treatment of uh, uh, kind of uh, therapeutic dose of uh, anticoagulation, but still we can see that there's no statistical significance. But these studies are ongoing studies, but only the severe state arm has been discontinued because of the futility uh, of this uh, uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Therefore, the American College of uh, uh, Society of Metrology, they clearly uh, given a guidance that we should not use therapeutic anticoagulation unless there's a proven evidence of uh, thrombosis or when there's a clinical suspicion of thrombosis. All the other patients should be given prophylactic uh, 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 anticoagulation, not they are even recommending the intermediate dose intensity uh, anticoagulation for these patients. So therefore, uh, uh, <clears throat> when you go through the literature, we found that there are so many errors that we have done during our uh, management of this pandemic, simply because that we are not adhering to the evidence-based medicine. So what is the way forward? How do we practice? It is challenging to practice evidence-based medicine in uh, the pandemic situation. What are the uh, what are the things that we can do? What is the way forward? The first is that we should remember that pandemic is a time to raise the bar of science and it is not to lower it. I think most of the international academia, they have done this mistake. They have not peer reviewed the journals, the researchers, and even the New England Journal of Medicine, even the Lancet, they have not peer reviewed their articles initially, but they found this a mistake. But remember, pandemic is not a time to lower your standard. It is a time to increase your standard of science. When we are reading the researchers, remember retrospective cohort analysis as well as the single center studies are highly unlikely to give us a definitive and timely answer. So don't base on your uh, practices as well as don't base your uh, decisions based on retrospective analysis as also from single center study because they are unlikely to give uh, important uh, findings. Uh, all the effort that we should give and focus should be given for prospective multi-center well-designed study. Uh, remember that we should always assess their outcomes, the primary outcome, it should be patient-oriented outcomes. We know there are certain studies even done in Sri Lanka they have done uh, PCR-based outcomes that is not uh, valid in clinical medicine. We should go for patient-oriented outcomes. And second, we should encourage routinely collected anonymized data to identify clinical and epidemiological patterns. So this has to be done. We should identify the patterns of epidemiology because in our, in our country, the patterns might be different to UK. And then we should involve as clinicians, I think as academics in all the medical the faculties and all the uh, universities, we should join together and deliver high quality research to ensure each and every patient with COVID should be joining these studies because all these patients will benefit. We should network with each other. We should network with all the specialties. I think we as clinicians happy to network with all the uh, academics and we should uh, do multi-center prospective studies and we should make sure all the patients with COVID-19 have opportunity to join these studies uh, uh, to identify their uh, uh, kind of to create the knowledge of COVID-19. Again, we should do regular audits. We should review our, uh, our uh, gaps. We should identify our gaps and to improve our quality of care. I think we should, uh, we should come to uh, a regular uh, revising of our management strategies as a team. And then I'd invite all the academic departments in all the universities, we should design uh, studies now and we can deploy them 
future in future pandemic settings we can make it in a hibernating setting i think recovery group from oxford university they have done that they have designed their studies before a pandemic comes and also we should also involve with designing all these studies uh, before a pandemic comes and when the pandemic is there we can uh, use uh, we can uh, we can use this protocol for studying and we can hibernate these studies until uh, until a pandemic comes so i think we should prepare uh, Uh, for these pandemics very well because uh, in future i think we will be we will be facing a lot with this uh, pandemic situation so in conclusion i'd like to uh, emphasize the fact that evidence based medicine should not be compromised at any cost during a pandemic we should modify it we should uh, go for adaptive uh, strategies but we should complete we should not compromise ebm at at, at uh, any cost and i'd like to thank again for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity uh, and i'd like to answer any questions at the later thank you amila for that lecture we will take up the questions at the end there's a slight uh, change in the schedule uh, the next speech is going to be done by dr dushant madagedara uh, he's a consultant respiratory physician from national hospital of sri lanka kendi his uh, uh, topic is never ending story post covid and long long covid what do you sir okay good afternoon sorry that uh, i had a request but i sent there to have my little little earlier because it was a due time anyway uh, as well as uh, i had to go back quickly as possible I think uh, you already listened to three lectures on the different aspects of COVID-19. So I think that this symposia should be a, I mean, the very very important symposia of the current day of practice. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank the CCP and our college to jointly organize this very important uh, symposia on the manage different aspects of management of COVID-19. And and I must thank Sandeepani as well who she invited me to be here. So. so i am going to talk the next 20 25 minutes of the other aspects of covid 19 what we are experience our day to day practice for the last one and a half years so my topic will be on a long covid post covid syndrome and post acute covid 19 syndrome the never ending story now you are listening to these three lectures uh, as mainly different aspects of management so i like to you to recall your knowledge on um, Patho physiological basis of COVID nineteen. I think only you can understand the different aspects. But I am going to talk a little later. You know that just uh, this labeling the various uh, patho physiological aspects of COVID nineteen. One is uh, due to the all pathological problems are due to direct viral toxicity, endothelial damage, microvascular injury, immune system dysregulation, stimulation of hyperinflammatory state. hypercoagulability with a resultant in situ thrombosis and macrothrombosis and maladaptation of the ace pathways so the collectively all these different pathophysiological mechanisms are involving produce a clinical disease of covid 19 that acute as well as the, the post acute another aspect i like you to take into your attention pathology and pathophysiology of the lung diseases you know that lung is the main stay of in all the main place of snolman is a one of the focal point lung pathology is due to two different mechanisms one is due to the in addition to what i mentioned in my the previous slide the viral dependent mechanisms where the invasion of the alveolar epithelial and endothelial cells by sars cov 19 they are by causing the damage other important aspect is a viral independent mechanisms where the immunological damage little more little detail including perivascular inflammation contributing to breakdown of endothelial epithelial barrier with the invasions of monocytes and neutrophil and extravasation of protein rich excret into the alveolar space giving rise to the pathological changes of pneumonia and the latter part there are different other complications and all phases of diffuse alveolar damage with organizing and focal fibroproliferative diffuse alveolar damage this can happen in the early phase and even until later phase of the covid 19 pneumonias Area areas of myofibroblast proliferation and the mural thrombosis and microcystic honeycombing are the one important pathological phenomena giving rise to the finalization of interstitial lung disease due to the COVID-19. 
and also as you all know they may be predisposed to bacterial colonization with uh, opportunistic or maybe a common pathogen and causing the, the various type of infection of the lung now this pulmonary vascular microthrombosis and micro macrothrombosis is also in roughly about 20 to 30 percent of patients with covid 19 third pathological phenomena i like you to take your draw attention is a mechanism of thrombo inflammation we are the different pathological phenomena is again happening here the endothelial injury and the complement activation platelet activation and platelet leukocyte interaction neutrophil extracellular traps release of pro inflammatory cytokine disruption of the normal coagulant pathways hypoxia similar to pathophysiology thrombotic microangiopathy syndrome so these three pathological entities are very important we need to understand what is covid 19 and what are the ill effects of the acute as well as a post acute phase next i would like to take your attention to this particular graph slide where when you infect infected with the covid 19 virus sars covid 19 the first you see the you get the detection the early phase of infection you may not find the viruses first four weeks of infection you get acute covid 19 where you can get a, get a viremia and you can detect by doing the uh, pcr as well as a rapid antigen and you get all the acute phenomena after the four weeks we call a post acute covid 19 it will first part of the post acute 19 the first 12 weeks 4 to 12 weeks we call sub acute or ongoing covid 19 after the 12 weeks maybe 6 months maybe 9 months we call chronic or post covid 19 so the this clinical phenomena is happening on the early phase acute as well as a post acute covid 19 so this graph is very important you to understand what is really mean the post acute covid 19 so the lone covid mean the combination of the sub acute as well as a chronic how do you going to define the lone covid or post acute covid syndrome is a signs and symptoms that develop during or following an infection consistent with the covid 19 which continued for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by alternative diagnosis so there can be other diagnosis to explain but it is solely due to covid 19 it usually represent with a clusters of symptoms open overlapping which can fluctuate and change over time and can affect any system of the body body so when i talk about a little earlier so it was a combination of the sub acute or ongoing as well as a chronic covid so long covid is a combination of both why why people develop the post covid or the long covid syndrome it is possibly due to the what i mentioned at the beginning the pathophysiological basis of the different aspects is due to the three main mechanisms the viral specific pathological changes that all of you know are well aware of what is happening in the, with the covid 19 and immunological aberration and the inflammatory damage in response to the acute infection third is a specter sequel of the post critical illness because this is a critical illness where you may be Uh, maybe intensive you get treated from intensive care or hgo you may have a severe infection so you get a combination of these causing the post covid or the long covid syndrome so little more um, um, uh, detail about that so the this is a syndrome when you get the patient after the acute covid that means after four weeks of illness you may get a combination of so the normal maybe the post viral patty lasting organ damage may be a lung so heart or kidney or liver or brain multi organ damage may be single or two or even many organ damage post intensive care if you send the patient to manage in the intensive care there are a lot of problem associated with we call post intensive care syndrome other one is a post traumatic stress disorders naturally you are you hearing every day from the the media and the, by verbally you know what is happening to some patient there are several deaths so naturally you will end up with a very stressful situation and the worsening of the existing medical disorder if you have a existing problem with cardiac or pulmonary any other diseases including diabetes you will be see the worsening so you may get a collection of uh, this different aspects now the very important to understand what is called multi organ effects of the covid 19 based on the pathophysiological basis which i explained at the beginning multi organ disease with a broad spectrum of manifestation may be a simultaneous may one after other increasing report of the persistent and prolonged effect of bacteria covid 19 is well evidence and well known currently multi organ effects can also include the condition that took up after covid 19 we call that multi system inflammatory syndrome 
it look like a autoimmune disease a different organ affecting the inflammation due to the different pathophysiological basis finally end up with the organ failure so organ in normal it is unknown how long multi organ effects might last and whether the effects could lead to chronic Ill health condition no one knows exactly the everything about the covid 19 is a day to day new additions of the knowledge and informations so the we may talk today may be changed tomorrow so the, these are new addition no one knows exactly what is the end results and the end effect of it with some experience we may see we may learn more and more in future like what to change our management strategies and even people who are not hospitalized very important to understand and who have mild illness can experience the persistent or lesser not necessarily you have acute covid syndrome or like you know 15% of the covid have symptomatic covid rest 85% are asymptomatic even asymptomatic even mild symptom can develop the post acute syndrome with a multi organ or other organ in normal so not necessarily be a acute severe covid who gets a long covid in the post acute covid now there are different uh, predisposing cause particularly if you have increasing age the elderly naturally your system is all you have more chance to get it uh, post acute covid or long covid if you are obese naturally you have a lot of other problem associated with that female sex and patient with asthma this only some available data and multiple symptoms at presentation if you see the multi organ in normal cv human naturally you can go on and uh, you can get a lot of other metabolic causes and patient may not have uh, sometime positive covid sometime we see patient now in a practical i have several patient come to me the history of two weeks severe lung involvement but pcr everything is negative but not, not could not able to be spring any other disease that's that may little late case may have impact three weeks before now coming with the post covid to me with the severe interstitial lung disease pcr negative nothing there but typical of covid but at the same time i cannot exclude any other cause and children also can get a purely 15 to 13 percent depending on the different age group what is known today with some available data as the uk office for national statistic estimate 1 in 10 respondent or the patient who had covid may exhibit symptom for period of 12 weeks or more one third of return to normal previous health after 12 weeks take it longer to return normal this is very important less than one third is the 30% had a symptom after 9 months so the major proportion of the patient with covid will have a chronic ill effects that's very important these are some I'm a publication actually I'm posting this slide you know, showing that what are those post covid symptoms i told this a multi organ in normal that's a basic simple to understand so you may see the various organ in normal i'm not going to say it may be a patik that i will discuss a little later with details the respiratory symptoms like a dyspnea cough or you know, muscular skeletal neurological many cardiovascular gi every system is in all including skin some symptoms like uh, say about fatigue breathlessness joint pain muscle pain chest pain etc further deteriorate the situation causing the reduced mobility motility and causing the mo mobility and causing the disuse atrophy and the muscle loss further due to many other reasons some symptoms like a smell problem lack of appetite even diarrhea which is a very common problem what we see day to day practice they will have poor nutrition and their weight loss will be associated with the chronic cachexia as well as several other complications as well. so these symptoms also further lead into the different problem now what is the best what is what is known today now with the patient covid 19 four weeks time we see the reduction in the muscle aches and chest pain and sputum production when you have when you manage the patient covid 19 end of the one month in the end of the acute majority will have some some reasonable improvement of their general symptom six weeks time cough and breathlessness substantially reduce Three months dying, they most of the symptoms resolve. Fatigue may persist. Three months or more than that, they may develop the post-COVID syndrome, which we'll discuss a little later. Six months time, the most of the time the resolution of the symptoms, uh, unless complications of the any other problem. So the now the different patient has a different, but this is a majority behaving in this pattern of improvement. Now I will address the different uh, problem of a post-COVID syndrome. In other words, a long COVID. one of the commonest is i am being a respiratory pe people we like to talk about the breathlessness the post covid breathlessness this is very important to understand this is a clinical medicine not only covid any other disease when the patient come in front of you you have to manage the patient now you then you need to have proper vocabulary i always tell my registrars and the 
Our train is, you can't just go and see the patient without knowing head and tail of anything about the subjects. You should have reasonable knowledge. With that knowledge, with the clinical skills, you are going to build up the case. So in the patients, the patients the post-COVID who are coming to us with the breathlessness, there are many, many causes can give breathlessness. All respiratory diseases from us, we know that the reactive airway dispenses, this is nothing new. Any viral infection affecting the lungs can cause a breathlessness, cough and we see mimicking asthma, but it is not asthma. Or the development of secondary interstitial lung is a very, very common problem, not only COVID and even other viruses. We see many, many cases. They meet different types of uh, interstitial lung. There may be a boof, maybe AIP, acute interstitial pneumonia, NSIP. I feel that mostly I see the mixed pattern of interstitial lung disease. And pulmonary hypertension and the multiple pulmonary emboli embolic events are very common in this group of patients. You may get that's maybe the reason for breathlessness. Cardiac causes, they are prone to develop myocarditis, heart failure, acute MI, cardiomyopathy, myocardial fibrosis, many. So all you can cause a breathlessness. And bronchiolitis, obliterance, affecting small airway without having pulmonary parenchyma, even maybe asymptomatic previously, develop the severe breathlessness. The drug in use, we all use a high dose of steroid, particularly symptomatic patient. They end up with many problems, particularly drug induced myopathy, diaphragmatic or intercostal muscle and accessories muscle. They can cause severe breathlessness. Critical illness, neuropathy and myopathy is a well known phenomena. All the neurologists and all of us, we manage all very ill patients, not only COVID, even other patients. We see this patient. And the post intensive care syndrome, I will come a little later, what is it? And exacerbation existing, maybe interstitial, heart, or renal, or liver, whatever illness you have in chronic, they can exacerbate, particularly pulmonary conditions. And pro traumatic stress disorder, because as this is very important. They are the, psychologically, they have a lot of problems. They become as a breathlessness. Deconditioning, because bedridden, keeping like in the prison, limiting their spaces due to various causes, they are de deconditioning. To drug impaired, critical illness, nutritional, and et cetera, et cetera. And some people have increased BM and get obesity because of the reduction of the weight loss of character with, with the normal nutrition or malnutrition or the low birth low body mass index. And the opportunistic, I mean, do not forget that the opportunistic infection, they can get into the lungs and cause in the lung problem. We may think the different, but that is maybe the reason for this. Yeah. And the, I come upon some later, and I see you, intensive care associated weakness, a different phenomena. Not only the critical illness, partly all are interrelated, that also very important. And other organ failure, like a CRA, paleo failure, all come with the dyspnea. But if you rule out all, then think about the personal. That is very common, I see in my day-to-day -day practice. A lot of patients come with severe breathlessness, trying to have nothing. Because of that, naturally, all of us are having the panic as well as the severe psychological stresses. And being uh, and knowing what is happening to them in the COVID and families and etc. When the patient coming to you in front of you with a breathlessness, having that basic background knowledge of the different possibilities, you have to think when the patient that it's very important to know these things. And this, this breathlessness may vary person to person, may not depend on the age, sex, or comorbid. That's very important to understand. You may be 101 comorbidities, but you nicely improve and go home and nothing after that. Young, strong, healthy uh, person coming with the COVID and develop all these complications. So even age or sex, all are same. 80-year-old patient walking and going home, but 40-year-old getting with severe COVID and respiratory failure and death. So although they are more predisposed, but that is not meaning that everyone is equal affected. So depending and the need. So what is important? The total assessment, detailed clinical assessment, examination, and investigation. This time is not permitting me to go into detail. As a clinician, and the, we need to know what you have to examine by giving the background knowledge of information. And then after you got to the basic history and examination and the thing, you have to do the investigation. We are going to manage the patient, not the COVID itself. So all the organ assessment you have to do, the ECG and 2D go. Detailed lung function and if a muscle weakness suspected, if you get a restrictive lung disease, otherwise nothing, you have to do the maximum voluntary ventilation. See, very, very simple test. We do the chest x ray, HR, CT, and CTP, very, very commonly we order. Rule out the interstitial lung disease and bronchiolitis obliterans and the pulmonary embolism and so on. And the six minute talk test and DLS and the medical research council dismiss care to see the functional status. Bronchoscopy we may do in the not all the patients, some patients, if you cannot come to a definite diagnosis, opportunistic infection, get a ball and other investigation, we may do. Maybe exacerbation of the other illnesses, we may need to do. So these are the basic group of investigation we carried out patients. These are some excess of my own patient having some chest show in the first section showing you see that uh, mild haziness and lean in opacity with some air trapping. 
the Kanan and is up to even upper zone as a ground glass, it's a linear. Uh, this one and the, this third one is a little worse than that, fourth one is same. This is very important. Land volume you reduce a little. Ground glass, linear opacity, sometimes you may see consolidation in the last x ray here. This big be boof, case of the boof. This, this is very important. You know, this is a case of the interstitial land disease mostly. This uh, the HRCT showing the generalized ground glass with the uh, scarring and the mosaic and the and the beautifully this linear peripheral opacity very well peculiar to the what is called this uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. We see many. This is the last uh, HRCT. You see this uh, linear opacities and there are many findings. Some usually the mixed pattern. These are the, some of these all are my own patients. Patients who are currently on management. These are the get a boof pattern, NSI pattern, mixed pattern, bronchiolitis obliterum pattern, etc. This is not my one. This is a other patient will get one there. And this is a, like a boof, but, but this is not a boof. This is a mixed pattern with a significant ground glass with organization. This is a nice, beautiful mosaic pattern with the bronchiolitis obliterans. So likewise. So, so the, how do you going to manage the patient of coming the breathless view? Now, this is how you going to manage the patient. So you get a detailed history. You have to come to the definitive diagnosis. You can't just give inhalers and some salbutamol and therapy and same thing. No. You should know what the patient is having. Then the multidisciplinary approach is very important. This is not a property of a respiratory physician. Everyone has to support us. Cardiologists, rheumatologists, uh, everyone, endocrinologists, but the diabetic control go out of and very difficult to control this patient because of many reasons, pancreatitis and etc. So the multidisciplinary approach is very important. General management next. Starting from the nutrition, breathlessness, relieving, psychological, everything had to be looked after. And specific manager, you have to come to definitive diagnosis. Is it embolism? It's IL, it's a boob or bronchiolitis or bleed, and there are a standard diagnosis management protocol. Pulmonary rehabilitation is a, is a, is a syndromic approach where we use the multidisciplinary approach with the support of the, all the discipline, such as the nutrition, functional, counseling, exercises, correcting the medical problems, so on. Yeah, so this is the total management. I didn't mention the deep specific thing because this is not uh, time to do so. And there are deep, deep, different uh, rehabilitation things and the different breathing maneuvers are very important and relieve the breathlessness, like in the first sleep breathing, for example. Right. Cardiovascular complications are very, very important. They have many problems. They have the myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, myocardial scarring, and the myocardial impaction, heart failure, so on. So they come with a... Uh, Features of arrhythmias, palpitation, breathlessness, chest pain, and autonomic dysfunction. So you had to get, uh, after you rule out the other poster, you had to get the cardiologist involvement to the management. Neuropsychiatry is very common due to the involvement of the COVID, due to the cerebritis, meningitis, meningoencephalitis, impaction, uh, inter, uh, what you call cerebral thrombosis, so such a sinus thrombosis. You get several. So you get all this common, the fatigue, myalgia, headache, dysautonomia, and cognitive impairment, so on. So you have to get a neurologist to involve with the support of us. And the endocrine is well known, very poor control of diabetes, subacute thyroiditis, osteoporosis, and hypothalamic pituitary axis, hyperthyroidism. There are, may, there are many, but this is some to mention. Your, your endocrinologist needs to involve. So this is uh, some of the breathlessness and the other thing. Other one is a very important, so long COVID fatigue. It's well known and associated with almost all the patients with the COVID. Fatigue is actually reported to be one of the most consistent and the persistent symptom people experience following COVID infection. To the physical effects, like the reduction in the physical activity or sensory, functional, psychological, cognitive, and social. So there are many, many aspects because this is a very difficult situation, COVID. Not only just illness per se. Not, if you have diabetes, you are nothing like that. You get a diabetes. But if it's COVID, the family has to suffer, isolation, social isolation, Job, opportunistic problem, and that means economic problem. So many things associated with this. So that are several, several risk factors, like increasing age naturally, will have more fatigue, and slight increase in risk of female patient, and the multi-system involvement, and the BMI, obese and uh, reduced BMI, both are getting uh, more fatigue. And uh, this is actually the syndromic uh, involvement, the muscle weakness, I'm not going to de in detail of this, you can read up. And fatigue, we got what I call chronic fatigue, and then got a chronic fatigue syndrome. So I'm not going to detail. You can, this thing you can repair just to get some idea how common chronic. Chronic fatigue syndrome is another important thing where it's a different condition where I think rheumatologists, psychiatrists has to help us. They have a substantial post excess malaise and the fatigue that substantially reduces the normal activities, muscle weakness, dizziness, so on. 
chronopathic symptoms, a different condition. We are, we are not treating, we have the rheumatologists and psychiatrists and all. And the management, we have a whole way of management, the nutrition, exercises, psychological, hydration, so on. So the fatigue, breathlessness, and physical activity are very three aspects we have to address in the patient with chronic fatigue syndrome, where the diet, mental health, and sleep is very important. I'm just giving you some information for you to refer if you're interested further. Other very important aspect I like to talk is what we call the post-COVID or the gluon the psychological aspects of the post-COVID syndrome. What are these factors which are related to the psychological aspects? It's very important. We are managing a patient, not the COVID, the breathlessness or this. Why psychological? For people severely affected by COVID-19 requiring hospital. So then you know the how agony they are suffering. Doctors are, nurses, when they had some previous illness, but pneumonia due to some other causes, five years before, now coming with the COVID pneumonia, how they are we keeping? Keeping the prison, isolation, doctors and nurses appearing and disappearing, sometimes the BHT ward down, not by the physical ward down. At the beginning, it was worse, now a little better. So then, what, what do you feel? What do you feel? And your own people cannot come closer. If you want water, you can't get a water, you can't get a news, you can't get it. Then talk a lot about the COVID, radio and TV, but do nothing for a patient as such. As I, as a clinician, I know that what is happening, the real practice. So this is not a BST ward down, the clinical ward down, so important. No, no point in the consultant come and look at the BST and go tell the RHO, most junior, just about the HO, to manage the COVID pneumonia and 101 complication without touching the patient. None of the seniors start to be appeared than there. So you think that RHO know everything about the medicine? It's one year of internship. So this is pathetic. This is pathetic. Very bad. Talk a lot, but do nothing. I am very, very unhappy with the clinicians. If we go to the patient, we have to manage the patient, not the BST round. Very important. This will affect everyone this sentence. So the stigma, isolation from the loved ones. This all are there. Just imagine if you had a COVID, this is what happened to you. And if a severe COVID, you know what is going to happen. You see the next bed, the patient is dying, the next last night. Another one just what called found dead. No one knows patient is dead. Doctor or nurse or no, found dead in the morning. Not given oxygen, not nebulized, nothing. Found dead. You can have found dead in the hospital. Then what is having the staff and giving all the claim that and this, so many leaves, that cannot be tolerated. Now, this is the community post-COVID. People who are having the COVID diet, this gets some study point. There's, I just you know, depression, they have 20 to 40 percent is evidence. Anxiety, like almost 50 percent. When they come to hospital, no one will be there like. Memory concentration, Peter, just give some example. Community who diagnose COVID in the community, these are the different uh, relations, difficulty, sleep, adjustment disorder, fear of COVID. Again, the second COVID. It's a hospital patient who are almost admit to hospital and going home after this, they escape. The depression, 40%, memory and cancer, almost 50%, and there are other involvement. This is a patient with the ICU and HDUs. Depression, all 40, memory and 50%, and the Failures and difficulties, sleep problem, they cannot sleep. That's exactly the patient come to and tell us. So see the, the problem, what they can happen after they discharge from the ICU, so if they escape from the death. This is very important. Without having COVID, having the two vaccines, getting all the benefits, having the minimal work of the normal work, having out of the two or 300 patients, normal clinic, having now five patients, this is what healthcare frontline front staff have. They have a depression of the 50%. Stresses and almost 70 percent, even more than the ICU patient. This is exactly what we experience, we experience in day to day practice. See the healthcare front, uh, frontline staff. Very difficult to some work to be done. When I want to extract, no one wants to come sometimes with a great difficulty having some almost near total physical fight, we get the x rays. So see that healthcare front without having the disease, how they were stressed. But this indirectly badly affects the patient outcome. Very important if the patient needs oxygen, to give oxygen. You can't give oxygen after two hours, then the patient is anyway going to die. If you want a high flow, high flow. If you want a CPAP, CPAP. Who can't wait for another two hours? You have to get tosis, you have to get tosis. You can't wait. If you have a second impact, you treat it. If you diagnose third of uh, six day patient more breathless, comparative to other parameters, which I think clinical cases discussed by Amita, then you have to start uh, even early AIPs. How do you know without seeing the patient, without doing the chest second, without doing the HRCT? You have to close the study department to send the patient for HRCT. So that's not acceptable. So the post-traumatic stress, I don't want to explain. Now you can understand how much stressors patients will have. This is very important. Post-intensive care syndrome. 
these when you patient intensive care are uh, very important they have a icu acquired in weakness come little next side cognitive dysfunction psychological problem now you at the previous side you show you this and the various intubation and other related complication we all know that patient intensive care will have a lot of other complication in addition to this is very important intensive care acquired weakness it is very important you to understand as a clinician can you exceed 10% of the loss of muscle mass in a one week of icu remember so if you have the two weeks three weeks how much you are going to lose then what are you going to have breathing how do you going to breathe so very important these are the diaphragmatic weakness and the various dysphagia this are called intensive care acquired weakness mast cell activation syndrome this actual multi system disorder disorder new phenomena it is due to the quite abnormal um, mast cell lung have in a multi organ involvement this is a organ in you can see the each and every organ in normal this is what is called multi system in normal uh, cause in this is aberrant micro abnormal uh, mast cell cause in this multiple including limb node can have limb node but we see the stress with the uh, ct with the limb node so you see the each and every system affected by the s1 and s2 problem other one multi system inflammatory syndrome in children mic i think i saw that various tv uh, things in the last two to three days by the few pediatricians spoke about it is a defined by the presence of palliation by the w less than 21 year old less than 19 years in the background w depression i mean the fever elevated inflammatory markers multiple organ dysfunction current no reasons ask for the infection and exclusion of other possible causes so these are multi organ you know including diarrhea they have overlapping i am not a pediatrician so the kawasaki this is almost overlapping that they know better than me but it's a little uh, pain in a pulse and strokes are see they seem to be more than the kawasaki so multi organ this is not only in children this can happen in adults so we can say multi system implant disorder in adults same pathological phenomena i told the mast cell this all uh, mimicking almost same now i just want to tell you now how the patients recover and send home this would have proper primary care system in this country but we have very good primary care but unfortunately not for a dengue another thing maybe but not for a respiratory problem as such as i far as no so the very good primary care system there then the patient can go to the primary care physician government or private i don't mind they have to with this background knowledge which i was speaking up to now at go to different history examination relevant investigation report to the specialist and relevant clinics that go to the total assessment i am not repeating the same thing i read all little earlier about other slides and the primary care physicians are very important to find out what is wrong with this covid 19 patient other countries they have a very well as a very well formed system unfortunately our ministry of health and department health talking every day how many death and how many cases i do not think that they have arranged us any any system of having primary care system for this patient under one pillows and come, come and talk the various nonsense but without arranging this type of very important aspects of post covid management so this is so if this if i post this i take upon this a well developed country there are there are well developed people are living in that country that's not only the economy so they have very good system they look after the patient and they look after the after infection so they have virtual conversations so you can converse with the patient that is all the smartphone that they find out what is wrong if they can manage at home it's called self care if they want a little more information they can get the guided self care exercises nutrition and etc if they think that uh, the health worker uh, after that means the respiratory nurse so in our setup phio midwife or primary care physician or mohs so in our setup then they have to decide to do this patient can self care or get a guided self care give little more information or specialist intervention or if the otherwise they have to refer to the specialist relevant specialist this is a little more in detail about that i am not going to repeat it. so go through the patient recognize problem and then refer and manage accordingly so i would like to talk about the covid clinics now we are talking about the covid clinic i am very happy to say that i started first covid clinic in this country almost now i think eight months we have a clinic full of patient we have lot we so this is simply when you get a covid clinic it's a clinic to go through the patient what i was telling up to now go through the patient get a detailed history find out almost all in normal report to the re relevant specialist maybe neuropsychiatric or psychiatric hematologist primary care physician few thing that can manage and renal and cardiac etc then you do the all in we do all the investigation to this my post covid patient who come to my clinics i my senior registrar level and my rp level and myself and my junior consultant will manage this and i i am in all and i want to tell you one very important state the post covid one post covid clinic i got the patient after covid that particular patient came to clinic came the second 
attack of COVID pneumonia. If we admitted to then and there, then and there, she had a severe pneumonia. We had to keep her almost two and a half weeks. Diarrhea, AKI, renal and liver failure, severe, she improved remarkably, struggling with the death. That's a, that patient we detected in a post-COVID clinic, second pneumonia. Luckily, she came that day. We managed her, then we, uh, she was almost fine. If respiratory white lung was almost back to normal, except some scarring. We got a CT and everything done. And then uh, to manage the, the com continuation of renal pair, we put this patient to the renal unit. Unfortunately, I got to know later, he died in that unit. Lung-wise, pneumonia was everything attacked. He escaped death, but later, some other reasons, he died. But not in my unit, anyway. So the, that is important. You can get this. So the so clinical assessment. So the all the clinical history, examination, do all relevant indices, which I told a little earlier, and the repair, go through the patient, diagnose, and refer to the specialist and manage accordingly. So if you try this chest sex a little abnormal, then you have to go for a detailed respiratory assessment, for example. And the COVID rehabilitation very important. Again, get the patient. And here, this is actually taken from the other, other part of the world and get the GP to go to the patient, decide what is the level of uh, disability patient is having and this respiratory problem, go to respiratory physician, cardiac, go to cardiac, the community physician will manage. So the primary care physician are involved in this particular, particular area of rehabilitation with the support of the other specialist. Just a little, a little more for the acute medical to the recovered one. So there are deeper and sub-acute medical problems. Acute based rehabilitation or do activation. Finally, we come to community based rehabilitation. Little more detail, but you can get this thing from the uh, online. I last few slides, there are many, many online, uh, many, many research going on related to the post -quay. This I'm just summarizing some. I'm not going to detail. I think you had a, you know, lectures had about the last lecture on trial and things. There are different uh, groups are having the different NIH recovery initiative. There are immunophenotyping assessment in COVID-19, COVID-19 observation studies are several studies, uh, long studies about how to, uh, to diagnose and find out <clears throat> what is the behavior of post-COVID-19. This, this is just to show this slide. <clears throat> this is uh, just to get the public awareness about the post-COVID-19 thing. And I think we should have several programs to educate the people, come to us with the post-COVID symptoms and to address and treat accordingly. This is one type similar leaflet. I think Ministry of Health, I don't know they have done or not, should have this type of thing. I to use the various media to advertise. I think the, I have touched on the various aspects of post-COVID. I think uh, very important to know that don't just think that after acute COVID things are over. No, this is never ending. I told you this. I think my topic is a very correct uh, topic. Now, you have to go to the patient, have to follow up to the relevant clinical assessment relevant examination, report to the, the specialist whoever related to the particular area of interest and manage the patient, manage the total, but don't think that ah, you give something and patient escape from the dead. No, I want to tell you the very important other thing, even acute COVID, after the acute COVID, there's a very high mortality for a lot of other problems. So very important you to understand. Well, we manage the COVID patient thing, we know that. Other thing, this is a new disease. Every day this is changing. New and new information will be added. What I tell now may not be true tomorrow. So the, the new information has to be added to the, uh, in the time comes on. I think I'll stop now. Thank you, sir, for that uh, very detailed talk from your heart. Uh, our next uh, 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 talk is on the cruel duel. COVID-19 and the tuberculosis co-infection and Sri Lankan experience. It's by Dr. Eshant Pereira, concerned respiratory physician, National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Valley Sir. Over to you. Uh, I thank uh, Sri Lankan College of Physicians and Sri Lankan College of Pulmonologists for giving me this opportunity of to talk on the, one of the important comorbidities of uh, COVID uh, infection, which I have uh, termed as uh, the cruel duel and the Sri Lankan experience. As everybody knows that uh, tuberculosis is one of the, is the most fatal infectious disease in the world. And latent TB infection is, 20, is found in 25% of the world population. And despite uh, uh, the, the effects by the WHO and various countries and the, the, the national tuberculosis uh, programs have estimated to have saved 58 million lives over the period of uh, 2000, year, year 2000 and 2018. 
but despite all these efforts even in on on 2018 still 1.5 million people died and 10 million people were newly diagnosed within within that year but uh, as a comparison uh, along with the uh, first six months of uh, the covid pandemic we have lost about we have found about uh, 1 million cases that's just a comparison and also this is known fact that uh, people having tb when they are having co- concurrent infections with other respiratory viruses as from uh, the sars uh, earlier epidemic in 2002 and the mers in 2012 and found that they do badly than the other non infected people considering the tb burden of the world the seri of the the seri region or southeast asian region and the african region amounts to the two thirds of the whole world's tb load according to who regions and with this who set an ambition stars in 2016 by 2035 to eradicate or end a tb epidemic over the next 15 years don't know whether it is going to be a reality with the with the uh, coming of the covid pandemic it has taken uh, overtaken all the global health issues and several other viral infections have been described as i said having a, a detrimental impact on tb and also from the early evidence uh, we can expect grave consequences in tb patient care with the pandemic developing it is feared on modeling uh, the global re- reduction of 25% in tb detection within a 6 months can expect a 26% increase in tb deaths over the coming years and uh, it is going to be expected for sri lankans as well a reduction of 21% of t- receiving tb care is expected for 2020 and uh, we are still waiting for the the real figures to come for the last year and it is ex- it was expected that half a million people may die due to covid covid and tb co infection and they have estimated that 1.5 million tb deaths expect uh, within the period of 2020 and 2025 are these patients with tb at risk of infection and negative outcomes of covid-19 although there have been observations of course there are uh, overlapping risk factors for the both groups the advancing age the male sex diabetes smoking and chronic kidney disease and other respiratory illnesses are overlapping risk factors that might impart an effect on the on both the disease as a comparison in uh, as in tb lung is the most frequently uh, associated with uh, uh, disease localized and also may reactivate or worsen the covid-19 can reactivate or worsen the tb disease and co infection may occur either before the tb uh, before uh, before covid or during covid or even after covid disease uh the there's a concern consistent finding that tb has been one of the most common comorbidity uh, which is going to be affected uh, which can affect uh, the patients infected with these viruses and co infection is expected to cause more severe disease with more rapid progression risk of disease one of the studies have estimated that there could be 2 to 3% 2 to 3 times higher risk of death in these patients and also the covid the chance of recovery in these patients uh, is 25% lower and the time to death was significantly short as well and there have been many studies from the epicenter of wuhan and in the philippines and many other countries which have been reported that the same effect and same findings uh, from early part early, early during the early period of the pandemic so is this observations are just a causal or just coincidental you may think that is a coincidental thing because already uh, tb may have been there uh, before the covid diagnosis or whether it is when the patient is getting admitted to a, for for a covid infection whether it has unmasked a subtle active tb which has been there or whether there is an establishment of diagnosis when the patients tb patients are superimposed uh, with acute onset of covid symptoms or whether it is because of the insufficient 
uh, infection control processes, practices uh, uh, which have been uh, there on, on the say, places of retention. The cause, when, if you call, consider the causal hypothesis, there could be a reactivation of the dormant lesions of TB or the common comorbidities may, or the co-infection may be a, be a problem or the uh, aggressive inflammation of, during the cytokine stage, uh, cytokine st storm stage, whether it is been the problem which has caused this uh, the re causal relationship. And it has been postulated whether there have been any mutation in the uh, signaling pathways of interferon gamma and IL-12. And there is a possibility of reactivation of latent infections also, whether it is due to the, the, the use of immunosuppressant drugs, the high dose of steroids and tocilizumab and so on. What are the clinical similarities and difference between the COVID and TB? Both are transmitted by airborne route, affects lungs, but they can affect other organs as well in addition to the upper or lower respiratory tract. Also, <coughs> Uh, one of the differences is in TB, you need to have a more prolonged contact with the infected patient, uh, but whereas in COVID, it is more easily transmitted by just a casual contact. And <clears throat> there's a problem of detection of COVID sometimes because the cardinal challenge, the, the diagnosis, maybe the um, cardinal uh, symptoms may be shared by the, both the diseases. One of the uh, striking differences, SARS-CoV-2 can be spread by asymptomatic patients, whereas TB is most, almost always like a, uh, un, from an unhealthy patient. And the symptoms uh, of COVID starts within the five days of exposure generally, and TB can get, uh, take more gradual onset over a peri period of weeks and months. And the active TB burden builds up during the weeks and months uh, the previous weeks as, uh, as opposed to the COVID viral load peaking in few days. When you compare the diagnostics, similar methods are important in both the diseases, although there are, of course there are differences in the, uh, the diagnostic uh, investigations, but some similar investigation could be still be used uh, for the diagnosis of COVID and TB, but there are always uh, similarities on X-ray findings as well, when when you which might miss the TB infection in a COVID patient. The both the diseases share many biosocial determinants: the poverty, overcrowding, social stigma, pollution, diabetes, and so on. If you consider active TB disease and COVID, Active TB disease itself will not make a patient increased at an increased risk of COVID-19 infection. And patients having persistent symptoms like maybe at, at risk of developing more severe symptoms, those who are having more symptomatic TB patients may, can get more severe symptoms. And also, since TB often damages the lungs, underlying COVID infection may make them prone to more severe COVID outcomes. And those who interrupt treatment, the TB patients, may have a worse outcome. But the TB patients who fully recover from TB without other medical problems uh, may not be having a higher risk of uh, COVID-19 infection outcomes. What about the latent TB? We know that 25% of world population is having latent TB and it's estimated and they are having a higher chance of getting 10% uh, chance of developing into the disease to its active form throughout life. But currently there is no evidence to suggest that LTBI alone places the population at risk of getting uh, COVID-19 infection. And it's also, it's unlikely that LTBI influences the symptoms associated with COVID either. But one important thing, LTBI is usually diagnosed with the test, the immunological test like TST, the tubercle sensitivity test and IGRAS interferon gamma release assays, they can still get a give a false negative findings when there is a uh, COVID-19 infection. And also in the COVID infection, there's high CRPs and the lymphopenia still can give a false negative results of this about this. We know that there is a very much interest in the world, I mean the leaders and the populations, everybody on COVID-19 
But despite the pandemic, the TB pandemic has not disappeared. The TB, uh, global TB has not disappeared. But is there a renewed interest in among the, the, the governments or policy makers towards these possibilities of uh, TB flare-ups in the future, the coming years? You need to be remembered that TB by far is most, most more deadly disease carrying an untreated mortality close to 50%. But mortality of COVID pandemic is around 2 to 5%. Two to five percent. And we have to be mindful that there are drugs which have been available over the last 75 years, whereas we are not having really, really successful drugs for uh, COVID-19 infection. Shouldn't we? Should we? Uh, forget about the TB infection during the, uh, the, uh, the years of pandemic. What are the direct impacts, possible direct impacts of COVID on TB? As I said, there may be difficulties to diagnose the, the uh, of, uh, difficult to diagnose TB because of the uh, common symptoms between the two. And also the stigmatization may defer patients coming uh, they are health seeking behavior uh, because of they may think they may not want to be identified as having respiratory symptoms fearing that they may be uh, rejected as having covid and also there could be a direct imp uh, impact on tb transmission because of activation on ltbi and uh, the subsequent transmission and also there are in facilities, some of the congested facilities, they are, there is forced isolation of COVID patients with or without TB patients. And also risk to other patients uh, in, in even, even in uh, ventilated facilities, when you have using high pressure ventilations, the possibility of or even high flow nasal oxygen of uh, them disseminating TB infections to the other patients who are on immunosuppression drugs in the ICU facility or HDU facility. And also, there could be an uh, increased uh, TB disease susceptibility also because COVID damages the lung and COVID patients may be on immune modulator treatments. And, and also, who have, those who are having da damaged lungs, residual compromised lung function, they may have this devastating sequelae. And as earlier speakers suggested, and giving therapies, immunomodulator therapies, I'm mean, being all enthusiastic, really giving three therapies may cause problems for the infections to come, including TB and uh, various fungal infections. What are the indirect impacts? The strain TB control programs because of loss of healthcare focus and diversification of the resources and TB notifications have already fallen greatly. And there, there may be effects on the hard to reach community, low income communities and the stigma and fear of hampering public health and also issues related to drug availability because of the supply chains may be harder to sustain because of the economic burdens and the uh, lockdowns. And sometimes the modification of treatments, anti-TB treatments, uh, depending on the availability of the whatever the drugs may, can cause, may, may cause uh, drug resistant TB. Also, there could be a likelihood of errors in prescribing leading to more adverse effects and treatment failures. But what, how are you going to treat the TB infections in, uh, in COVID-19 infection? Anti-TB treatment for latent TB or drug sensitive or drug resistant TB should be continued. There should not be a difference in therapeutic strategies, but you should be mindful that there are possible possibilities of drug interactions between TB and TB drugs and the COVID therapies, including the additive hepatotoxicity, hyperuricemia, thrombocytopenia, QT prolongations, and screen reactions, and so on. A few words about tuberculosis and COVID-19 vaccines. What are the lessons we have learned, what the researchers have learned from TB vaccines and the research has been going on? It is very well known that vaccines are crucial for a, a crucial strategy for prevention of widespread infectious diseases. And it has been, it has been uh, estimated that long-lasting vaccines can be more cost-effective than chemotherapy. But long and the long experience with TB vaccine developing 
development going on for many many decades exploring numerous approaches and platforms may help to develop may have helped to develop covid-19 vaccines as well so the end point of the covid pandemic is either having a herd immunity or by the effective vaccine coverage so the we, the aims of these vaccines are to protect them from infections prevent clinical symptomatic disease and reduce severity and death there have been multiple candidate vaccines developed different types of vaccines including the viral vector vaccines vaccines and uh, the nucleic acid vaccines and the live attenuate and so on especially the mrna vaccines uh, we heard earlier in the uh, in the pandemic week that there is a speculative efficacy of bcg uh, against covid 19 people have observed in some countries that routinely use the bcg vaccine in neonates had less reported cases of covid but there were not there were no firm evidence at yet test because this this most of them are epidemiological studies just based on observations and there have been many uh, significant uh, co uh, con confounders with differences in because each, each country may have national geographic uh, demographic differences disease burden differences testing rate for covid 19 and all these change they were thinking that all these tb prevalent countries it is less reported covid is less reported less less, less problematic whether it is due to the effects of bcg vaccination but over the last few months all these uh, myths have been shattered when we encountered the uh, the, the pandemic in uh, india many factors may ultimately impact this effectiveness of bcg vaccination it has been it has been, I, i also came to know while i was preparing for that that in different countries 14 different substrains of bcg have been employed in different different countries for bcg vaccination of the, the neonates the vaccine formulation and the route of administration have been again uh, uh, the way of uh, giving uh, creating better immunity it has been said oral and intranasal bcg given even in brazil has given a better uh, immune response than the subcutaneous route so but what they have postulated is bcg when it is given it 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 uh, it activate even uh, active tb or latent tb infection or uh, or bcg by given by uh, uh, bcg vaccination can uh, can stimulate innate immune cells or train immunity so in the absence of clear evidence <coughs> who has suggested they recommend continue using of the bcg neonatal bcg vaccine in countries of settings with the high incidence of tb but they don't they do not recommend bcg vaccination for prevention of covid-19 at at present and they are waiting the out final outcomes of two clinical trials waiting the uh, outcomes of uh, clinical two, two clinical trials one in western australia and one in netherlands they which are which they analyze the bcg given to healthcare workers directly involved in covid-19 work what the outcomes are like so the the second interests have been co administration of bcg and sars covid virus vaccines together they have postulated whether they have a, a synergistic effect uh, of both being together because they thought that the the it increases the duration and the efficacy of the memory response and mitigate the effects of other potential infections and also may may be associated with decrease in the severity of the disease covid covid disease thank you so there have been novel based bcg based approaches as well they have developed vaccines together with bcg thinking that when when it is given you create innate immunity so that the memory innate memory cells will last longer uh, when presented with a, as using the bcg uh, uh, live attenuated bacterium as the vector and two two of this viruses uh, the vaccines are being tested at present and what are the other what are the benefits from covid-19 vaccine development for tb we have learned there have been lots of gaps 
in a development of vaccine it normally takes about more than a decade to come into function but they have learned that close collaboration between the developers the funders and the regulators have been uh, have to be developed if you are going to develop a vaccine and also we have learned which we have never the, the, the tb uh, the bcg our tb vaccine developers we have, whom we have not not even thought about in the past having a, a mrna vaccine the use of rna vaccines they have learned the lessons from uh, covid-19 development there are some advices to be given with regard to covid-19 vaccination and tb testing usually inactive vaccines do not uh, interfere with tb tb diagnosis test especially the immune based tb test but tst and igra does not known to pose any additional harm or risk to the efficacy of mrna vaccination but a negative result from a tst or igra might be less reliable after mrna covid vaccination so it is advisable to place tst and draw blood for igras prior to covid 19 vaccination but you have to delay the tst or igra if prioritization for receiving covid 19 vaccination has to be given of course that is the problem in the country at the moment also if you if you know if you come to know that if there is a vaccination program you cannot be waiting for the tst to happen so you have to do the prioritization and plan it time it accordingly but if mrna vaccination has already occurred you have to defer the tst agra until 4 weeks after the completion of the two dose covid 19 mrna vaccination all potential recipients of covid 19 vaccination in that case if you have to take a decision of the timing you may have to uh, speak to the healthcare provider which has to be taken earlier few words about sri lankan experience i will be generally talking about the experience what we had at nhrd national hospital for respiratory disease valisara from uh, november last year we have been uh, the ministry has requested us to take all patients with covid-19 plus tb infections basically we got most most patients from the Uh, from uh, the western province we have collected about 66 patients 48 them were males and 18 were females and the age age distribution of 19 to 73 years with a mean median age of 55 61 of them were ptb pulmonary tb and five were extra pulmonary and we had extra pulmonaries of cns tb gu tb tb spine and tb osteomyelitis as well and symptoms at presentation most of them are moderate most of them were mildly symptomatic with res with respiratory complaints and there were people with uh, mildly symptomatic without respiratory complaints too and the other majority was the asymptomatic ones but for the for the reason of isolating covid and tb together uh, they were hurriedly sent to valisara and we have this two wards has facility to house them out of the 66 52 on uh, new treatment regimen and retreatment on 13 and one mdr case as well and many of them were <coughs> on the continuation phase uh, intensive uh, in intensive phase <coughs> many of the new patients were on the intensive phase and uh, many of the retreatment cases were also on the intensive phase of ntdb treatment what were the complications 40 nearly 41% of patients had complications and uh, about 10.6% had uh, covid pneumonia and four had hyperemic respiratory failure and uh, drug induced hepatitis in nine of them as expected with treatments and various impacts on the other organs covid pneumonia in seven thrombotic events in one patient and renal failure in two septic shock in one lung abscess in one and same reactions in two patients what was the outcome out of the 11s sadly we lost 11 patients that is about 11 out of 16 66 that is about a huge percentage of 16.6 percentage our normal figures of over the past last two decades of tb mortalities were between 6 to 7 so this clearly shown that 2.5% uh, 
uh, increase or two to three percent increase of deaths among even our small cohort of patients who have been admitted to uh, the, uh, the to the hospital with COVID and TB co-infection. Many of them are only 20 patients needed the exomets soon, and seven, 27 were given uh, enoxaparin, and none got uh, tocilizumab, did not qualify for. And strangely and very notably, we had two patients with post KT. One of them was 12 years after the transplant, who went into septicemia during the post COVID phase. What is the impact of the programmatic management of TB in a district? According to the district, Gampa District Chest Clinic, our case detection has dropped from something around 11, 1,100 or 1,000, roughly about 1,000 cases to 847 last year. And over the last six months, we have found only 406 cases. And clearly, case detection has significantly up more by more than by about uh, uh, about 40 to 50 percent contact tracing has been again a big big, big problem over the last year while expecting 100 percent contact tracing but we have been enjoying about 74 percent over the years 74 to roughly around 70 percent it dropped to 35 percent over the last year and still in the first six months it is about 11% contact tracing. According to the DGC of the, the, the District TB Control Office of Gampa District, he says, no, no one is interested in coming to the hospital facility to get them tested for training. And, and uh, move on to that. Many parents are not bringing their under five year children for TB, even for INH prophylaxis when they have been and positive PTB patients at their households. So, the default rates and death rates all have been have shown impacts due to COVID and TB co-infection in Gampa district in this small cohort. So what are the problems we encountered in our short experience of managing patients over the last seven months? We had lots of, as, as Dr. Madhigar earlier suggested, we had lots of problems. Even to date, whenever a patient is admitted to uh, uh, the facility of uh, the triage ward, the, the laboratories, both laboratories are refusing to do any, any sputum samples for TB. We have been trying over the last one and a half years to get this done, but no one is agreeing to do a sputum testing unless, until they become COVID negative. That's a big problem. And initially there was a very big problem with chest radiography as well. People were not happy to come and do the x-rays in the, even on the triage ward, on a COVID ward. Now it has been ironed out now. But there have been radio actions by allied staff as well, uh, hampering the, 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 the efforts of us to treat these patients. And there have been, strangely, there have been reluctance, even to date, to perform blood and urine investigations, even to do a uh, blood grouping on a COVID patient or a suspected uh, triage ward patient even at our hospital. Still, they are reluctant to do a urine, simple urine, urine analysis or a culture for a, for a COVID patient. As we all know, when patients are treated with immunosuppressant or immunomodulated drugs, when they have their CRPs are spiking and the fever developing, we, are, we, we, we cannot simply do a, just a urine FR or a culture. Being in a national hospital for respiratory disease, it's pathetic. So, TB programs must prepare themselves for the major difficulties ahead as a consequence of COVID-19 pandemic. And we have to ensure continuity of services of training, preventive and curative treatment. And we have to be proactive in planning, procurement, supply and risk management, human resource development, capacity building efforts. And we may have to utilize family member as a treatment supporter. And also, we need to provide necessary psychosocial, nutritional and economic support to these patients. And of course, those who are seeking care at a chest clinic have to be protected uh, from COVID pandemic care. So we have to take that adaptive measures as well. And also, we have to protect our staff working in, the, in these units. And we have to prioritize giving the vaccination to these people with COVID-19 infection. 
as well with uh, PTB, uh, palmar TB infections. And <coughs> whenever they are coming for uh, for COVID-19 evaluation or TB infection, the, both both diseases have to be have to be evaluated as we expected uh, very grave outcomes in this patient. And also, we have to utilize all injection-free uh, uh, regimens for MDR-TB patients. Other, other alternative options are, we may have go for the digital uh, advanced technologies like virtual care and telemedicine and to manage at least the adverse effects of adverse drug events of the patients and community management solutions. And also, we have to uh, be proactive with doing the procurements and careful planning of local drug distribution and transport. Of course, TB laboratories can help with, with uh, the COVID testing facilities because the staff is already uh, experienced in handling airborne pathogens and analytical instruments and biosafety equipments are already available with, with uh, real advice and, and commitment. Okay, so with that, I will conclude my talk. I have to give my special thanks to our senior registrars in uh, Valisar Hospital for providing the details of these patients who have been admitted to with COVID infections and TB. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, all five speakers for their excellent and very informative lectures. Uh, now, this is the question and answer session, but uh, we have run short of time. So I would like to give time for a, a question and answers from the audience. Uh, I would like to direct this question to Dr. Amit, Amila Ratnapal. I don't know whether he is um, available to answer that online. Um, uh, ha, hi, Amila. Yeah, um, this is regarding uh, one of the hot topics of uh, pulsing, methyl prednisone pulses on um, COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, now, you talked about the evidence. I know that you didn't talk about because I, I think there's not much of evidence on that. Um, now, but still we uh, see um, patients who've been um, uh, treated with methyl prednisone pulses. And if, if there's any evidence of uh, methyl prednisone pulsing, uh, I would like to ask what is the evidence and when, what, what dose and how long? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, that's an excellent question, Dilshan. And uh, yeah, as I said before, I mean, it has been not uh, heavily studied. I mean, for the time being, uh, the BMJ, there's a perspective on that. I mean, the experts are talking about that. Uh, for the time being, uh, there are some interim analysis going on. Uh, the evidence is actually this, uh, uh, the place for methyl prednisone comes when the patients are going to the acute fibrinous or organizing pneumonia stage. So basically, we are talking about after day 14 to day 21 of the illness and uh, when uh, the lungs are going into this organizing pneumonia stage. So it's a secondary uh, organizing pneumonia, secondary to the viral infection. And at that stage, we are using methyl prednisone pulses. Again, uh, from the perspective and from the expert evidence uh, all over the world, it is not the high dose that we are using. We are usually using a moderate dose of 500 milligrams. And then uh, we are using, there are various regimes and about 500 milligrams for three days and then come down to 250 milligrams for three days and then one milligram per kg per uh, day, something like that. So, uh, but again, that we don't have any randomized control trials for the time being, but there are perspectives. We are talking about it. Even there's a perspective at the BMC. I'd like to refer to that article. And, uh, and again, that our personal practice is that when the patients are only going to the acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia stage only that we are considering a pulsing of steroids uh, with methyl prednisone. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask, like, uh, when do you suspect that uh, situation, the acute fibrinous uh, uh, pneumonitis on this patient? Which day of illness you, do you suspect this? Yes, again, uh, this acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia, actually, uh, we are suspecting after the hyperimmune phase, that is after day 14, day 21, basically in my experience, most of the patients I have seen around day 21. So at that stage, we see patients are increasingly becoming oxygen dependent. There are all the parameters of inflammation are coming down. The CRP is coming down and there are 
uh, uh, the blood counts, the lymphopenia is coming in, getting improved. At this stage, we see worsening of opacities with uh, increasing oxygen demand for this patient. So basically what we see is actually the oxygen demand is not getting reduced, not getting pair with the, uh, the inflammatory status of the patient. Therefore, at that stage, we can see exclude all the other possible kind of uh, other causes like possibility of uh, thromboembolism. And at that stage, we are doing a chance CT. So chance CT interpretation is very important at this stage. When you see the perilobular as well as peribronchovascular consultations at this stage, we consider uh, there's a possibility of uh, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia. And at that stage, we, we start pulse. And there are good results actually, but certain patients actually, they go into fibrosis, but still uh, in our experience, there's, there's good uh, results with uh, methyl reduction pulses at the stage of organizing pneumonia, which has to be diagnosed radiologically with the high resolution CT scan of the chest. Thank you, Amit. Can I ask another question or do you have any other questions, Shamit? Yeah. Okay, um, again, uh, Amila, uh, uh, I've, uh, one physician raised this question now. They see patients who are not hypoxic at rest, but when they exert, they be, you see their saturation levels go down. And uh, uh, they raised this question that some of these patients who don't have uh, saturation drop at rest, but on only on exertion, who have... Uh, imaging changes, suggestive of COVID pneumonia, um, uh, starting steroids on these patients. Is there any evidence uh, for that? Or what do you think of uh, from the current evidence uh, on recommending steroids on these patients? Exactly. I'll explain about it because we increasingly see these sort of patients nowadays. For example, uh, we have uh, developed a modified kind of, there's a modified exertion test. So what we do is actually we, uh, we make the saturation, we assess the saturation at rest. And if it is more than 96% on air and the patient can be walk, walk unaided, in that case, we ask the patient to walk about two minutes. And after walking for about two minutes, if the saturation drops for more than 4%, we, we, we consider this as a positive test. But unfortunately, there's a one prospective study on that, which has been studied on who, what is the proportion of these patients will develop to the severe disease. I mean, that, that uh, in that limited prospective study, what they have found is actually, there's no significant proportion. Actually, there's no statistical significant proportion is progressing to the severe disease in that group. So therefore, the, I mean, they have not studied about the steroids in that group, but that is a very, uh, interesting area that we are working on uh, for, a, for a prospective study. But uh, if you come to the clinical trials, the recovery and all the st studies, actually they have clearly included uh, patients who are hypoxic at rest. So for my experience, actually uh, routine giving steroids for these patients might not be uh, really helpful. I think we should do a very, we should not transfer this patient to the intermediate centers. These patients should be with us. We should prospectively follow up these patients and uh, from the available evidence, not on all the patients will go into the severe stage, but only some will go. I think in that case, we, can, we, we may consider steroids, but st uh, starting steroids at these patients at that level might cause more harm because one thing is that this patient might be in a, a severe viremic phase, at, I mean, at these patients. And number two is actually they might have any other causes for this uh, hypoxia on exertion. For example, they might have underlying uh, respiratory condition, which is manifesting with COVID, or they might have any other cardiac problem. So therefore, I think uh, we should evaluate this patient properly. We should keep the patient with us, not to transfer them for the uh, intermediate centers. And uh, I think we should, after careful evaluation, if the patients only deteriorate for a, a resting hypoxia with evidence of COVID pneumonia, and uh, I think we can consider a starting steroid, but for the timing, recommending steroids or not to recommend steroids based on uh, best available evidence, we don't have that evidence. But from one study, we know that uh, not all these patients will go into the severe disease. Right, and uh, these are one question uh, from the chat box. Anyone can answer this question. What is the best timing for intubation from NIV? Yeah, Dr. Afshay last. I think and Dilshan. No, no, I was, going to, I was going to ask Dilshan to answer that. <laughs> uh, Afla. No, no, you ask. You, I want to ask. Yes. Uh, you go ahead. No, no, I want you to answer. 
Actually, I wanted Dilshan to answer. Uh, uh, happy to answer that question. Um, I think it, when it comes to intubation, um, now this is a respiratory failure we are all dealing with. I believe that this is a viral infection which is going in the lungs. I think we are doing certain therapies, DEXA, certain drugs that we give to reverse the viral inflammatory process till that what you do is basically support the organ, the, the lungs. So then oxygen, when it comes to oxygen therapy, you start with nasal cannula, face mask, nasal high flow CPAP, and then ultimately patients might end up in intubate, you know, invasive mechanical ventilation. Now, this question, I don't think that there's a like, no, black and white answer when to intubate. <clears throat> I think the most important thing is you see when their work of breathing is high on very you know significant amount of oxygen on at least a CPAP um, device. So you see, you, I mean, there's no cutoff value as such, but you see them. You you see the trend, not that not as a you know a cross sectional value. You see the trend where this patient is heading. You see some patients rapidly deteriorating, requiring invasive ventilation. There's no doubt the base patient will anyway end up intubating uh, and going into invasive mechanical ventilation. But the problem comes when some of the patients who are on either nasal high flow or CPAP or NIV, not 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 rap, I mean rapidly deteriorating, but also not improving as well. So this is where the challenge comes. So I believe you have to carefully monitor the trends. Now these patients are mostly managed in the HDUs. <clears throat> so HDUs, now when you, when you see the HDUs, HDUs in our country mostly run by the RHOs. You, sometimes patients are actually not seen for a couple of hours. You see patients might deteriorate slowly, slowly, but at the last time you tend to intubate, they crash and they come up with a cardiac arrest. So that thing, so that is not the best point to intubate. So in these patients, you have to carefully monitor uh, for their work of breathing and slowly increasing oxygen requirements and, and the effort that they uh, generate to breathe on this high uh, oxygen therapy is a ominous sign that this patient is not going to do well on uh, CPAP. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's what I can tell on time of intubation. I, I think there's no hard and fast rule when to intubate or when not to intubate, but always don't intubate who should not be intubated. Then the people are trying for an ICU where the candidate should not be intubated and we have our facilities are lacking and uh, people argue why didn't you take this patient to ICU but obviously can is not a candidate for an ICU but since the patient has a tube you should take the patient to the ICU so always prioritize your patient uh, and decide if this patient is going to be escalated are you going to end up in invasive mechanical ventilation these patients I'm telling you with experience so these patients who are intubated runs a horrible course. Some patients will quickly recover, especially the younger ones. Uh, we had to paralyze their muscle, um, uh, muscle weakness go into zero power in a couple of days time because we paralyzed them. Then you acquire in an infection. So in our setting, it's very common to acquire, um, ISO acquire infections, especially the gram negative bugs very quickly. So ultimately they will not end up uh, with uh, dying of COVID pneumonia, they will die of uh, sepsis. So you have to balance this uh, in our setting, when to intubate, when not to intubate. If you compare, if you look at, uh, if you compare it with the, the studies from the, uh, the developed world, and also you ask the patient before, if the patient is conscious and has the capacity, ask the patient, are you happy with uh, going into invasive mechanical ventilation because you might be asking for days, weeks, or sometimes maybe months on a tracheostomy with no muscle power. Sometimes <clears throat> they, you see these patients are very delirious in the intensive care unit. So <clears throat> uh, I know the data on 
the patients who had invasive mechanical ventilation had uh, the poor outcome. Is it because the invasive ventilation is not good or whether the patient's disease severity is more is questionable. Uh, so answer to your question, I think there's no hard and fast rule. Always look at the work of breathing and the trend and the trajectory of the patient. Dilshan, thank you. Uh, I think this question arises from the fact that the, the, as a whole, the uh, intubated patients don't do well at the moment. Now, this is a fact of life. And then uh, if you, I think if you preemptively intubate, we will kill more by uh, preventing the necessary patients from getting ventilated because the lack of uh, ICU beds is a, is a fact of life in this time of uh, COVID. I think the important thing is to monitor these patients for uh, closely so and and liaise with the experts and see who can be saved and and give them the best care when possible thank you again i don't what dilshan said uh, of particular concern is these patients who have a high work of breathing and who take in a lot of tidal volumes so we see uh, tidal volumes in excess of 800 being delivered uh, are there any uh, surrogate markers like the lucid work of breathing and these patients and this um, L and H phenotypes that we speak of? Are there any, uh, 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 not in the ventilated patient, but those who are being non invasive ventilated, are there any surrogate markers and should the approach about timing of, the, of intubation be different in these two groups? You mean uh, the LNH type? LNH type so I think the uh, the L type is the patients who have the good compliance, and the H type is the the who have very stiff lungs who wet. I think the patients who have stiff lungs probably would have been intubated uh, by that time uh, rather than you know waiting because uh, these patients tend to respond very well with especially with prone ventilation because. It behaves as uh, like you know ARDS, but uh, when it comes to the L type, which is the early phase, uh, you see patients who uh, take large tidal volumes. Uh, that shows that uh, they they are starving for the the hypoxia, and when it when you take a large tidal volume, they, it creates a large um, negative uh, intrapleural pressure that causes uh, tra the trans pulmonary pressure to go up. Uh, so that that's the concept that it uh, come up like you know the patient induced lung injury which cause inflammation because of uh, high tidal volumes so be careful when you are with the uh, the uh, nivs who are on nivs they have significant leaks so when when there's a significant leak you see uh, their tidal volumes uh, you see 700s 800s but actually that's not the tidal volume they are getting because uh, the, the volume is higher because there's a leak. So always see, if you have a graph, always see the loop is completed. The inspiratory and the expiratory loops are completed. Then it gives us a uh, you know idea of how much tidal volume the patient is uh, getting uh, with their breaths. So, <clears throat> uh, so answer to your question, L-type and H-type. I think the H-types usually uh, would be at that time would be have would have been intubated. So L type is the the ones that could go into the H type, or there may be in, uh, changes in between. Some patients behave in, in different. I mean, uh, like a hybrid version. So be careful always. What I feel is the looking at the trend is the most important thing. Uh, it may be you know hours uh, or maybe days. So important to see how the trajectory of the patient. Just to add that, uh, add to that, uh, in my talk, I explained uh, about uh, one study and one extensive uh, workout by Gitanoni and the group. So in that, uh, obviously, there are uh, different school of thoughts about that. And uh, especially the Russian group have, a po I mean, they have uh, come out with their own explanation of this H type and L type, whom to intubate, who will be get benefited uh, with early intubation. So this, according to the Russian, uh, the Italian group, what they say is with their, uh, the evidence is there for to have early intubation 
if you have any way of identifying H type like ultrasound or the the use of NIV like uh, Dr. Dilshan said about the loop and all that. So, however, when you connect the patient, we don't know no, at the when the patient is arriving to the HDU or to the emergency, especially into the emergency, we really don't know how to assess immediately or, uh, by basically you put the patient on NIV if the patient is in acute respiratory failure. So what they say is, if there is early, if if, if the uh, the leak is also uh, checked, and if you think that the, there is a high minute um, uh, ventilation in the uh, first twenty four hours, so that is a, a clear indication that this patient can go into uh, NIV failure. So then uh, the escalation plan has to be discussed then and there for early intubation according to those uh, 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 studies. Yeah, thank you all. And uh, now we have come to the end of the CCP specialty update in pulmonology uh, with the collaboration of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. And uh, I must thank all the five speakers for their excellent lectures. And uh, as a token of appreciation, I would like to hand over the certificates. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Amita Fernandu? Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, unfortunately today we need uh, we had to postpone the uh, expert webinar. So we will uh, inform you about the uh, next date the f after we fix it. And uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Geeta Perra and the uh, Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists uh, to collaborating with us for this month. This is the month of pulmonology, and uh, also the staff of the. Uh, Basically, and also Chandimani, he is the uh, from our council. She is the coordinator of this, uh, the whole program, and the staff of the CCP for their work, and also the uh, clean mark as well. And our sponsors are the Ciders uh, Hemas, and uh, our usual audiovisual uh, team. And uh, probably we will plan to have the expert webinar on uh, before this uh, end of this month. Thank you so much, and thanks for participating uh, as online as well. Thank you.